would like to invite Susan Ross up to say a few words about them. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back from the break. Um, we have had just an absolutely terrific start to our day one focus on Laudato C. And um, I'm really, really proud of our theology department. But I will look at Michael Agliardo as a kind of honorary member of our theology department, too. So, um, so I'm very grateful again to Mike Murphy and all of those who have worked so hard. But um, so our panelists are, are terrific. Just, I just wanted to say a couple of things that I had occurred to me as I was listening um, this morning that, um, and my husband would be pleased for me to say this, that I was thinking of the great philosopher theologian Bernard Lonergan, uh, who is also a Jesuit. Well, Lonergan is famous for his four transcendental precepts, which are be attentive, be intelligent, be reasonable, be responsible, and the codicil to all of this, and if necessary, change. And so I think what we've seen so far is the importance of paying attention. What's going on? What's going on in our environment? What's going on in the way we respond to these issues? Be intelligent. What is happening? How can we make sense of this? How can we see the connections between the various events that are taking place? Be reasonable. What kinds of conclusions can we draw from all of this? How can we bring ourselves to make sense of this in a way that leads us to our final point, be responsible? What kinds of actions should we be taking in all of this? And I think it's calling us as well to think, how should we change? And so I'm very grateful, again, for all of you for coming, because you're not just passively taking all of this in, for the students especially. You're not just taking notes and going back to class and saying, see, I was there, I listened. You are also being educated to change. You're being educated to think about all of these things and apply them to all of the various areas in which you're studying and acting. So I want to encourage you as active listeners, active respondents, to take all of this back to spend the rest of the day and thinking about this, especially to come to the teaching later on. So that's my little pep talk for today. Again, a thanks to all of you for coming and participating. A special thanks to our panelists, whom Robin is going to introduce. And of course, let me just add my thanks, where are you, Michael, to Michael Murphy, who has been the, um, the czar of this whole process today. So, thank you. <laughs> associate professor in the psychology department and I'll be kind of moderating this discussion for the second panel here today and maybe pulling out a few discussion questions and then hopefully getting some of your thoughts and feedback on this next set of chapters as well. So uh, Dr. William French will be talking to us about chapter four on integral ecology. He's an associate professor of theology here, uh, graduated from Dickinson College, got his master's in divinity from Harvard and his PhD at University of Chicago. And he mainly studies religious ethics, ecological ethics, policies, and war and peace issues. Uh, so please help me welcome Dr. William Finch. Thank you all very much. I learned a lot from the first panel. Uh, again, thanks to the organizers. A lot of work went into this. Laudato Se is the first papal encyclical to address in a sustained way the, the rising concerns about ecological degradation and climate change. It thus marks a, a real significant shift in magisterial thinking and, and in moral emphasis. While the Catholic Church has long emphasized the need for social justice and a respect for human rights, Francis is now conjoining that long-standing moral emphasis to a new set of moral res responsibilities, namely our responsibilities to care for and protect the entire community of creation. Dominant streams of both Catholic and Protestant thinking in the 19th and early uh, first half of the 20th century placed great stress on humanity's distinctive subjectivity, dignity, and historical agency, and stressed God and Jesus Christ's ongoing relationship with humanity within the dynamism of the context of history. 
This was an era of surging historical acceleration, so it's not surprising that mainstreams of religious thinking during that period focused on history as the proper frame of understanding the, the central relationship between God and humanity. Nature, by contrast, seemed so vast and dependable, so vast, in fact, that it was a system that seemed to, uh, to theology and philosophy to have little uh, relevance directly. Theology and papal teaching came to stress human subjectivity, dignity, and the primacy of Christ and Christ's grace. Christology came to trump the historic stress on the order of creation, even as the sphere of the non-human natural world came to be viewed by many as having little import for theological and philosophical understanding. The Enlightenment's focus on humanity's distinctive rationality, freedom, and dignity was reinforced in the 20th century with the rise of existentialism and personalism. Across the wars of the 20th century, World War I, II, Cold War, it's not surprising that attention would be concentrated on the vulnerability of, the, of human lives. Francis's encyclical, I submit, shifts this human history-centered paradigm by first diagnosing how human history has grown so dynamically powerful that it's tearing up once long stable ecosystem rhythms and disrupt, disrupting long stable climate patterns. By, by his focus on ecological disruption and climate change impacts, he's breaking new ground in papal teaching and moral focus. But moreover, he's also attempting to recover the church's medieval cosmological frame of understanding of the human condition that is thoroughly grounded in a creation-centered understanding that human life is created and sustained through the living energies of Earth's natural ecosystems. Francis first tries to diagnose the problem, namely massive ecological damage, climate change threat, and the heavy impact on the world's communities, especially the global poor, and then builds from that. Second, he reaches to response by going deep into the Catholic medieval heritage of great creation-centered thinkers and doctrines, appeals to St. Francis, Thomas Aquinas, the stress on nature's laws, and the stress on the order of nature as a theological book of revelation. Uh, it's important to note his strategic timing is critical. We, we uh, had the Lima Climate Summit last December, and um, some hope came out of that just before the Lima Summit. China and the United States for the first time agreed. China um, historically agreed to caps on carbon emissions. The United States had balked in, in taking, uh, setting binding caps on our own climate uh, greenhouse gas emissions. If other giants uh, like China and India were going to get scot-free uh, of binding caps, India quickly joined on. And so as we move toward the Paris Climate Summit coming up in December, it's, it's important to note how the Pope is strategically trying to raise his voice and draw the attention of the world's Catholic community and the U.S. Congress and anyone else who's listening to the importance of these ne climate negotiations now. One of my charges is to discuss chapter four on the in integral ecology. It's a prominent theme of his encyclical is to marry a long-standing emphasis of liberation theology, uh, stressing the poor and the oppressed, and the Pope is trying to marry that to creation-oriented theologies and the cosmological creation-oriented medieval paradigms of concern for planetary care and ecosystem and species protection. He argues that the environmental crisis and global poverty crisis are not separate crises, but rather they are conjoined in one complex crisis. Quote, strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to combat combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time protecting nature. As he states, it's essential to seek comprehensive solutions which consider the interactions within natural systems themselves and with social systems. And we heard from the previous panel uh, a good bit about the integral uh, ecology notion. <coughs> To those, there are some interesting details in, in his analysis. To those who have tended to stress social justice and human rights and human dignity, the Pope emphasizes that each living organism 
is a creature of God and therefore must be recognized as, quote, good and admirable in itself. Uh, in ethical theory, he's emphasizing ecosystems and non, the non-human uh, creatures with whom we share this planet. They have an intrinsic value independent of their usefulness to humans. Um, he's mining the Catholic medieval world of the great chain of being where it's every creature has an integrity and dignity all of its own. The modern subject-centered paradigm in uh, Catholic theology has gushed about the human created uniquely in the image of God, but it forgets, as Thomas Aquinas often noted, that every creature is created in the likeness of God. Uh, God is the cause and all the creatures are the effects of God. Uh, so in this way, Francis expands the circle of preciousness and dignity to include the non-human natural world and all of its creatures. A distinctive theme that he develops in this chapter is what he calls the ecology of daily life. And um, I think it's clear that uh, John Paul II, for 25 years, concentrated the Vatican's attention to the concern about abortion and birth control and gay issues and, and pushed a natural law argument to back and flag those as distinctively important for a Catholic moral sensitivity. Francis opens up a perspective to remind us of the practices of daily life. He was a pastor in Buenos Aires. And he, he calls for authentic development to include efforts to bring about integral improvement in the quality of human life. And this entails considering the setting in which people live their lives. So I got to thinking about Chicago, even as he is so shaped by his experience in Buenos Aires. He's very interested in the geographic setting in which diverse human communities developed. He's very interested in the problems, but also the great opportunities and grace that happens in large cities. He emphasizes uh, the sustained experience of those challenges of high density urban areas, but he also has deep concern for the rural poor. He, he speaks about the problems of the poor in quote, densely populated urban areas, but he notes too how much good and how much community life can occur in the barrios of his experience. He, he um, criticizes the cold architecture displayed in many urban megastructures and drab apartment blocks that reflects the values of globalized technology. He elaborates the importance of urban design, the importance of neighborhoods, and good public transit design. Uh, he straight states, given the interrelationship between living space and human behavior, those who design buildings, neighborhoods, public spaces, and cities ought to draw on various disciplines. So he's very interested in the quality of ordinary life as practiced uh, every day. How the issues aren't just the, the, the critical importance of <coughs> sexual ethics and sexual responsibility, but responsibility in how we get around, what we eat, how is our food produced, how many transit miles does it take for our food to get to the table. He, Finally, I want to um, uh, go back to the issue that first raised by Sandra Sullivan Lomar uh, in the earlier panel, that Francis um, strongly critiques overconsumption, but, but falls, interestingly, silently about the scale of human population growth. While I deeply appreciate the overall paradigm shift proposed by Francis, and I appreciate his humility and courage and his openness to engaging those or outside the church, I cannot end without naming what I believe to be a critical shortfall of this encyclical. I applaud his critique of the lie, as he puts it, that Earth's resources are limitless. He states quite rightly, the time has come to pay renewed attention to reality and the limits it imposes. He strongly critiques the notion of infinite or unlimited growth, which proves so attractive as he puts it, to economists, financiers, and experts in technology. It is based on the lie that there is an infinite supply of the Earth's goods, and this leads to the planet being squeezed dry beyond every limit. 
But it's very telling that Francis does not extend his critique of unfettered growth to humanity's procreative powers. Francis critiques those who, instead of focusing on justice issues and, pro and the problems caused by expanding consumerism, um, and he critiques those who only propose a reduction in the birth rate. He argues that demographic growth is fully compatible with an integral and shared development. As he states, quote, to blame population growth instead of extreme and selective consumerism on the part of some is one way of refusing to face the issues. But as the community of ecologists have long argued, population growth is a powerful driver along with production and consumption advances of general resource exploitation, ecological degradation, and climate change threat. Despite, despite Francis's emphasis that, quote, everything is interrelated, he seems to hold that in discussing the drivers of current rates of ecological degradation, we have to choose between either stressing population growth or rampant expansions of global production and consumption. But almost no ecologist holds that there's one single causal factor. Why do we have to choose between those? Almost all ecologists I know do hold that both global consumption patterns are in good part pushed by surging population growth across the 20th century. In that century, human population quadrupled from roughly 1.6 billion to 6.2 billion. We've crossed 7 billion. <coughs> Lester Brown, one of my favorite environmentalists, asks quite tellingly, how will we feed 8 billion people when attempting to feed 7 billion has required the transformation of wilderness regions and uh, natural ecosystems into monocrop agro-ecosystems. The Pope seems, seems to be trying to deflect a major point made by ecologists that the global community desperately needs to achieve population stabilization. He vaguely speaks of needing to pay attention to, quote, imbalances in population density, end quote. But if everything is connected and interrelated, as he so stresses, then must not we see that the massive connection between surging population growth across the 20th and 21st centuries joins surging production and consumption patterns as dual conjoined drivers of climate change and ecosystem degradation threats. Francis has admirably taken the first step in this encyclical. I hope he follows it up soon with an encyclical explaining how the Catholic Church has reconsidered its condemnation of birth control. I will suggest that the nat a natural law understanding, and he emphasizes the natural law repeatedly, and much of his document is a, an attempt to ecologize our understanding of the natural law, that the, an ecologized natural law approach would recognize that ecological and hence natural law, that a species like our own that overwhelms the carrying capacity of our environment undercuts the conditions of flourishing and even the basic habitability and does damage to other species, to all human communities, and to future generations. In conclusion, I deeply appreciate Francis's main effort to call us to ecological responsibility. My hope is that he will soon integrate the need for ecological re responsibility in matters of human procreation. We can no longer afford to structurally avoid the huge impact made by rapidly advancing human population numbers. Thank you. speakers. Our next speaker is Dr. <coughs> Lilla Hawker. Uh, she's the Richard McCormick Chair of Ethics in Loyola's Department of Theology and is working on foundational questions of ethics and Christian ethics. She's an expert in many areas of applied ethics, including bioethics, political, and social ethics. She's taught before here at Frankfurt University in Germany, Harvard Divinity School, uh, and for the last decade, she served as a member of the European Group on Science and New Technologies to the European Commission. Um, so they issued a report on energy ethics a few years ago. So please help me uh, welcome Dr. Hilla Hopper. Thank you.
thank you, Mike Murphy, for bringing us together here as the speakers. Um, encyclical letters always also, among other things, tell a story. So I want to tell you one too. When I was a child, I'm from Germany and I'm coming from a rather rural area and all my family, grandparents and, uh, from both sides came from farms and we would go there, although we did not own a farm ourselves, my, my family had moved into the little town. We went every weekend to the farm of our grandparents and I spent every single vacation on the farm. I loved cows, I loved horses, I loved chicken, I loved cats, I loved dogs, I loved all the animals, and I actually also loved the plants, and I loved to work on the farm, and my, my god aunt always was convinced she will become a farmer. What did I love? I loved that especially the cows had names. They had names. Now, I was born in, in the early 60s. By the end of the 70s, even in my rural area, northern Germany, on the farms, the cows did not have names anymore. Yeah, on some farms, but northern Germany is a big agricultural kind of area, or region of Germany. Cows do not have names anymore. They have numbers. And this is what I want to tell you what the encyclical is about. It is a kind of a transformation from the I-Thou relationship that actually embraced and included animals or creatures to the I-It relationship during industrialization and post-industrial societies. <coughs> and the narrative he wants to get across is can we reverse this in a new way in the 21st century to another kind of an I-Thou relationship? And can we make use of the tradition that we have that calls nature not just nature that can be instrumentalized, objectified, and used for our needs and desires, but calls it creation? which, by the way, is a theological term. I was asked to concentrate on the fourth chapter, which is um, about approaches and actions, or lines of approach and action, as it is called. And this is the probably the most political chapter in the encyclical. The interdependence obliges us to think of one world with a common plan, says Francis. Now, in order to understand that from a social and political perspective, the relation between actors and actions is pivotal in this chapter. From global to local initiatives, the Pope explores what has and has not worked, what could work, and what is required in order to correct the current path. I will take these insights up and frame them around the concept of responsibility that seems to me has been uh, one of the current themes already this morning. Now, I will put the actors and the actions a little bit together to make it shorter here. Let's put it this way. One could uh, sum up the first part of the chapter um, in the following term irresponsible responses. That's not very encouraging though, but one has to acknowledge that. One irresponsible response to the current crisis, which is an ecologic and a social crisis, as we have heard already, is complacency. Another is denial. And the worst, maybe the worst, but not unconnected to the other two, is delay, delay of actions. I don't know how many of you were not born in 1992, the time of the conference in Rio. Maybe some of you were not born, but I guess that many of you were born around that time. I'm only reminding myself of that because I was around for quite some time at that time already. 
We do not begin history at the point here in 2015, and we do not end history. We start in the middle of something. There's always something been going on before us. So climate change was on the table already at the beginning of the 1990s. And what do you do as political community when there's a problem? Well, you organize conferences, okay? <laughs> So there were quite a few conferences, and I won't repeat all that. The Rio, the Basel uh, Convention, <coughs> the Vienna Convention, the Rio Plus 20 in 2012, and as we know, the Paris Conference Summit will come up too. This has been going on for quite a while. I'm not interested in the conference per se. I'm interested in, interested in what the Pope pulls out of the strategies that were negotiated that, or even um, implemented, although implementation seems to be the elephant in the room here. So let's say mm, they negotiated or talked about equal share of costs for climate change. Shouldn't we do that? Good idea? No, not a good idea because it would penalize the poor countries for something that they have not caused. Instead, one could say, shouldn't those be held accountable who have caused this problem and compensate the poorer countries. Isn't that a better strategy than the first one? Well, could be. Many philosophers and ethicists discuss this in the name of rectificatory justice, forgive me. Um, but forget about it, it will not be followed through. What about carbon credits? That worked really, really great. That was the big thing here. Yeah? The Pope says, yeah, that's all fine. You, you, can, you can buy and sell your, your carbon credits here. But it does not overall reduce the consumption. What, it is a nice trade system here, but it doesn't work. What about reformula reformulating the notion of development by way of sustainable development. Yeah, that has happened with the Millennium Goals, with the reformation now of the Millennium Goals. Sustainable development is certainly on the table. However, 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 it would require subsidies. It would require technology to transfer. And it would require the will to really take development in the first place seriously. Look at the numbers, it is not being taken seriously. What about the reformation of governance structures? Well, the Pope in this chap chapter picks up one, but one example, the governance of oceans. And what he pulls out of that example is, there's a big fragmentation of re international regulation. No mechanism to enforcement is in place, and that is just kind of an example for the overall regulatory system. Now, where are we? What should we do? His first suggestion on this highest political level is we need enforceable international agreements, which must be transnational, but they must also be regional, and they must be based on global regulatory norms that we yet have to formulate. So it is not, given the history of these conferences and summits and so on, he does not shy away from that and say, forget about Paris 2015. He says that is what is needed and we should press for that. We should even, and he follows Benedict there, we should call for a global world political authority. I have many question marks about that, but I leave that for the discussion. That's international politics, if you like. But then he addresses politicians as politicians, meaning as persons who are in office, calls them to engage in the principle of subsidiarity. And I find it interesting because he defines it newly. Subsidiarity grants freedom to development to develop the capabilities present at every level of society, while also demanding a greater sense of responsibility for the common good from those 
who wield greater power. I will come back to that. It is the universal right to development and access to whatever is needed for development, but also a differentiated um, notion of responsibility. And politicians need the foresight and long-term policies, visions, let's say. The norms, the international and global norms, are actually meant to endorse and enforce new approaches and new interdisciplinary approaches, something that the Pope um, emphasizes throughout the, and the encyclicals. So let's say these are the politicians and the political actions, and that has to happen there. It is actually the Merkels of this world and the Obamas of this world for the time being, as long as they are in office, they have this responsibility and there is something that we can learn from the history of the last 20 years, to say the least, what has not worked, the strategies. Okay. What about the economic actors and their responsibility for an ecological economy that he has been addressing throughout the encyclical? Well, oops, there is a conflict. <laughs> You have to break with a specific kind of economics and economy. Francis is pretty blunt about that. If you want just to maximize your profit, if you want just to utilize the cows or nature, you are not in with us. You are not in with us. If you only want to endorse and promote infinite growth and consumption as the condition of your business concept, you are not in with us. However, if you want to build up an economy that is based upon productivity by recycling, by energy efficiency, and by ecological innovation, making use of everything that technology gives you, you are in. So this is not anti-technological, it's not anti-economy, it is anti a specific capitalist model and a specific use and understanding of technologies. You will need to accept, he tells the economic actors, that there needs to be some containment of growth in some regions and in some areas, think of meat, of overconsumption. There needs to be a rede redefinition of progress and there needs to be a debunking of the image enhancing, I love this, debunking of the image enhancing rhetoric of ecological and social responsibility. Or call it corporate social responsibility or by now corporate ecological responsibility image enhancing only, not really effective, and he names it. And there needs to be a fair assessment of the social and environmental costs for the profits. If you acknowledge that, he addresses the economic actors, and of course I frame it a little bit here, then you are in. Then you are in. To the civil society actors, especially local groups, he says, struggle, put pressure on politicians, form local cooperatives, energy cooperatives, organic food or food cooperatives. It's all being done. This is not an invention. It's just reading what he does. Form a movement and be a participant in the interdisciplinary environmental impact assessments and the ethical assessments. In all that, the Catholic Church has a decisive role to play. Religion has no other ethics to offer. Religion has an other hermeneutics or another narrative to offer. That is the one that I call the I, the. Okay. I could speak of, and maybe we have time in the discussion, or read it otherwise speak of the concrete suggestions of a prospective environmental impact assessment and the ethical assessment of the new businesses and the new technologies that should be 
put in place in spite of or in contrast to the consuming businesses and technologies. What I find striking, and that, with that I will end, is that the environmental and the social crisis is based on a structural, or structure, I should say, of injustice that needs to be addressed. It needs to be answered by a prospective, I call it responsoric responsibility, meaning responding to the disfiguring of Earth, our sister, and that is a quote, the response to the disfiguring of the Earth, our sister. Response with a differentiated response dependent on power and position, depending on the history, and depending on priorities that are necessary. Applying a prospective assessment of <coughs> actions, applying the precautionary principle that means also the reversal of burden of proof, meaning that you have to argue for the exclusion instead of arguing for the inclusion of creatures. Argue for the exclusion, not for the inclusion. And promote plural languages or hermeneutics giving meaning to the re realities we live in. In short, I stick to the text of the chapter and I find so many rather radical proposals in there mm -hmm. that it is worth to be read. Thank you. Thank you, gave us a lot to think about and hopefully talk about uh, in a few minutes. So our final speaker for this panel is Dr. Michael Schock. He's an associate professor of theology here at Loyola holds a doctorate in Ethics and Society from University of Chicago Divinity School, uh, two master's degrees in Religious Studies and Political Science from University of Chicago, and his bachelor's degree in History from St. Louis University. He mainly studies Roman Catholic social thought, theological and philosophical ethics, social theory, and current moral problems. So very well qualified to be just today. so much for inviting me to participate. I'm really honored to, to be able to do this. I am uh, uh, to speak on uh, chapter six, ecological education and spirituality. Um, I have a PowerPoint, obviously my colleagues won't be seeing the screen, so I'll do a little bit of reading as I go along to kind of, I guess, to help you along. Uh, I'm the last, obviously, um, to go. But I want to follow Francis's non-linear method in his encyclical. Now, his encyclical method, he circles around, and he circles around, and he circles around. So I want to start by, start at the beginning on this question of spirituality. Because uh, I think there's many layers to his discussion of spirituality. And the layer that I want to uh, speak to uh, is the way he begins. And he's saying, you know, I want to address every person living on this planet. Now, in the history of Roman Catholic social thought, Pachim and Terrace was really an exciting document, in part because the addressees were all people of goodwill. That was exciting at that time, in 1963, that a pope was expanding the addressees to that uh, uh, cohort. In this encyclical, it's, it's like, I want to... I want to speak to people of goodwill, bad will, twisted will, <laughs> struggling will. You know, I'm in there with you, and I want to speak to everybody. Uh, that, that's exciting. Uh, that's a new openness, uh, I think. And I think that says something of, that I want to say about his spirituality. Uh, I think he approaches spirituality at this very broad level in a very humanistic way. And Ronald Rollheiser, who um, I think is a very, a very good writer and thinker on this issue of spirituality, 
uh, has his book Holy Longing, which is a presentation of a very humanistic spirituality that has lots of Je Jesuit tropes on, on spirituality and desire. And I just wanted to lift out um, uh, this, some of his main points, because I think they, they really link well with Francis. Spirituality is what we do with our desires. The desires you have in your life, your particular desires for self-expression, the kinds of human relationships you choose, the kinds of things that you elect to study, the kind of the ways you recreate, that ensemble of desires, the way you choose to satisfy them reveals the meaning that you, that I, that we give to life. The meaning that we give to life is our inner spirit our spirituality. And I think that's really where Francis wants to start on this topic of spirituality. All human beings have a spirituality. So when we talk about spirituality, we're not talking about an esoteric, mystical topic that's a subset of theology or a subset of religion. We're talking about a feature of the human condition. When, before he gets to the sixth chapter, he has lots of observations about the spiritual life uh, through, from chapters one through five. And I think the thing I wanted to lift out from those was that if our desires, if we focus on spirituality and desire, if our desires are shaped without attentive, loving contact with nature, our spirits will become degraded. Our desires will, over time, become fragmented and shallow, will become narcissistic, will become, become consumerist. What you desire matters. And if you're not in contact with nature in the formation and shaping of your desires, that matters. If such a spirit seizes a whole culture, and he talks about a, a spirituality of a whole community, more and more human actions toward nature will be callous, will be exploitative, will be selfish, will be short-sighted. It will be a function of a spirit that's become degraded for loss of contact with nature. <clears throat> and, and this is the point that he makes throughout, more and more actions towards human beings will become aggressive and violent. Spirituality matters. Because our desires matter. The, this is a quote from early on in Laudato Si. The violent, violence present in our hearts is reflected in the symptoms of sickness evident in the soil, in the water, in the air, and in all forms of life. And he says, this cannot be written off as naive romanticism. Right? You cannot dispatch what I'm saying here about spirituality. You cannot dispatch what I'm saying about desire. This isn't a parlor game. This is real. And an, an event that he, he well knows, because he's, he's commented about it when he was a cardinal in, in Argentina, was this uh, massacre that took place in 1992. I think it was 92, let me look again, 96. Um, at the uh, El Dorado uh, dos Cairas a village in the southern uh, province, the state of Para in Brazil, which is the size of Europe. That state in Brazil is the size of Europe. And uh, in the 1980s, uh, the Brazil nut trees, that whole state was just a state of Brazil nut trees. And for thousands of years, peasants, indigenous people and peasants have lived there um, harvesting Brazil, nut, Brazil nuts and building their huts and living um, a sustainable lifestyle. Um, and for, for hundreds of years, the, the uh, land, landholders, landlords, uh, uh, allowed that to continue and allowed those peasants to live there, only, although they didn't own the title to land that had been given to to uh, these landlords by the Portuguese, uh, by the crown in colonial times. 
in the 1980s, that land begins to be, the, the uh, Brazil nut trees began to be tilled under to make for grazing of cattle for McDonald's and for other corporations, primarily the, the, to serve the uh, beef needs of our country and, and others. That left, that displaced the landless peasants. Um, and they formed a, a, a movement, a movement of landless peasants to kind of protest what was happening to them. They had no title, obviously, to this land, although their you know, people had been there for centuries. But you know the, the scenario, it's familiar how it, how it plays out. As it happened uh, in April 17th of 1996, the landowners, with the complicity of, this, of the state police and the death squads, uh, 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 massacred 19 of these landless peasants who sat on the edge of a grove of um, Brazil nut trees to try to protect them from being plowed under. Much the way the Chapko movement or Chipko movement in India where the women put their <coughs> arms around the trees to protect them from Wilson uh, racket company uh, chopping down trees for rackets. Uh, in this case, however, the uh, uh, the, these 19 landless peasants were massacred. What the um, uh, children and relatives of those 19 peasants did was they burned down that grove and they left 19 tree trunks standing as a monument so that they wanted people to know when they go by this that the relationship between the destruction of these trees and the destruction of these people is real. And, and it's, a, it's, we have a conflict of desires here. We have a degraded desire for profit. Meeting, meeting a desire for life and it's a desire for sustainability. And when those two things do not meet evenly, when they're meeting in conflict, people die. And in this case, uh, uh, these 19 uh, let the land, uh, landless peasants died. The number one factor in this kind of complacency Complacency about the earth and its connection to the human spirit, the cry of the earth, the complacency about suffering people, the cry of the poor in relationship to the earth. That complacency, uh, the one, uh, this is from a recent book that from, uh, called State of the World 2014 by the World Watch Institute. The number one factor contributing to eco complacency is the ever-lengthening psychological distance between ourselves and nature as we live more and more divorced from direct physical contact with the natural world. And those landless peasants are saying, look at these trees. Look. Don't just drive by. Stop and look. Laudato, from Laudato say 44, kind of moving through it again, uh, France is saying, we are not meant to be inundated by cement, asphalt, glass, and metal and deprived of physical contact with nature. He's serious about that. A healthy spirituality thrives on regular observant contact with nature creating a condition for the possibility of experiencing awe at the sheer giftedness, the beauty, diversity of the natural world, of sensing, most of you that know Ignatian spirituality, the contemplation of the senses, the importance of engaging the sensorium, of sensing the intrinsic value of the natural world, and of recognizing, of recognizing our own creatureliness as connected to the natural world. That's a kind of spirituality that only comes, can only come, 
through some kind of attentive, loving contact with nature. Our ecological crisis, he says, and this is said in many documents, is a summons to profound interior conversion from eco-separation and complacency to eco-contact and care. A conversion, as we've heard already in, in many different ways, a conversion to pay attention. I have to do a quick little story. I've got three minutes left, but I have to do this story. So, um, my father died in 2010. Uh, for most of his life, and for, for most of my life when I was still at home, our family doctor was Dr. Rice. We'd go in for a checkup. I sometimes accompany my dad for a checkup. And the nurse would do the, you know, stand a scale, take the blood test, blood pressure, do all of that, write down the data. Then you go into Dr. Rice's office, and there Dr. Rice sat smoking a cigarette. <laughs> His fishing equipment was in the corner of the room. Well, Pete, how are you? How you been feeling? How's work? How's Bert? Conversation. Looking at my dad's eyes. And he wasn't just making kind of just a superficial conversation. He was doing a diagnosis. The nurse had the data. He was doing the diagnosis because he knew my dad. In 2008, my dad uh, uh, was further debilitated. Dr. Rice was long gone, long dead. And we had to put him in a uh, special care facility. The first time I took my dad to the doc, and you maybe had this experience, the doc was looking at the screen. My dad was over here. He was semi-incoherent. What's your name? The doctor never looked at my dad. Took all the data down and I think was probably looking, doing one of those evidence-based kind of methodologies where you plug in all the stuff and you press a button and, okay, here's the drug. Next. He didn't look at my dad and it agitated my dad, even though he wasn't, you know, fully competent. I remember I took him back to the facility and I could tell he was agitated. And I, I, I played a song for him on the guitar that I know, that he loved, and his eyes, focused on me, and I could, and, and, we, and I played the music, and he, he, he became relaxed. He, all the stress that that experience created for him, it, it drained out and he, he became himself again. Uh, what's the punchline here? Uh, <laughs> I think that what, what Francis is trying to tell us is, you know what, We're, that's how we treat nature. We're looking at the screen. It's technology. It's convenience. It's consumption. It's the screen. We don't turn and look at it. No more than that doctor turned and looked at my dad. That, that doctor did not know my dad. And Francis is saying, we don't know nature if we're not looking at it. So you can do all the political scheming, you can do all the, the frontal cortex work. If you don't look at nature and know nature affectively, you, you, you're not going to get the right diagnosis. We're faced with an educational challenge. How to educate. How to lead us out to nature. I'm thinking about this. How about in our university programs, how about an alternative break immersion into the natural world? Francis seems to feel that the earth is, is crying for attention. An opportunity for a student to have a guided, sustained immersion into nature with instruction and observation techniques, personal reflection, journal recording. Or how about in our personal lives? Um, I think I'm going to try this. Frankly, I've never done it in my life, but I've been reading about it. How about finding and regularly visiting a nature mandala near, your, near you over a cycle of seasons? An opportunity for you to closely observe and enjoy the beauty, complexity, changes, the biotic and abiotic features of a square meter of earth 
over the course of a year. You don't have to go any further than your backyard if you're lucky enough to have a bit of a backyard. You can do it there. That's what um, David Haskell did in this book, The Forest Unseen. He took his students out there, he took a square meter and looked at what was going on in that square meter. He said, I believe that nature's ecological stories are present in a mandala-sized area. The truths of nature may be more clearly and vividly revealed by the contemplation of a small area than by donning 10 league boots and covering a mountainside. The search for the universal is infinitesimally small. And this is pretty cool for a biologist to experience ultimate reality through a tiny hazelnut, the reference to Julian of Norwich. Which is an it, which, uh, I'm out of time, but the, <laughs> which points out this thing that's really fascinating to me. So many biologists are talking about the relationship between inner peace, social peace, and this place-based perceptual ecology, the necessity to engage nature. And David Orr, Michael Thomas, Edward Wilson in Biophilia, Carl Safina, Paul Kraft, and they talk about the spirit as they're uh, engaging nature. So a healthy spirituality, one that desires the inner peace and social peace of all human beings is a spirituality educated in care for the earth. And as we've seen, occurred so many times, it cannot be emphasized enough how everything is interconnected. Thanks. sharing your passion about this topic with us. Uh, we have about a half an hour left to discuss, and I thought I would just uh, pull out one thread that I saw kind of going through the different talks to serve as a jumping off point and get the panelists' reactions to it, or they can interpret it however they like. And then uh, we will definitely have some time to get your thoughts and comments and questions as well. One, one thing that I was struck with as I was reading through the encyclical was how bold and strong of a call the Pope had for us really calling out our levels of consumption as a moral policy issue. So saying, you need to change, though, your way of life, right? And I was wondering, given the wealth of some members of the church and the power of the church, how is this general call for critiquing our culture of consumption being received generally uh, by the Vatican, by the wealthy uh, people that are involved with the church, and uh, are, are they doing anything to, is anything being done right now, is this inspiring people to change? I know Loyola has a plan for sustainability, uh, maybe your thoughts and reflections on what's working in Loyola's plan, uh, what could be added or improved on in their plan as well. Coming, coming, or listening to, to Mike, I would, I, I would say this. There's, there's one level in the discussion that I become slightly uncomfortable with, and that is kind of this: you have to change, you have to change because you have sinned, and you will be blamed, and so on. What you have said is a slightly different narrative. It is, it, it makes me long to get in touch again, maybe, or maybe for the first time, with nature. It is, not, it is not just about giving up something, it is going somewhere. And I think, rightly so, you, you, you emphasize that as, as something from, from the, that comes from uh, the encyclical. And so your question, what does the church do, right? Well, the church is wealthy. The, the, this this pope certainly has called for, for another lifestyle, also of the clerics and so on. But who am I? Who am I to, to say it's not in my realm of influence or something? Yeah. So um, I think what we need to acknowledge is there. There is, Bill, you said that there is this um, a space everywhere, 
in the richest palace, there is a space to this, this transformation. And in, in uh, the slum and in, in the spot that you have in a refugee camp, there's also this, this space where you can still have your agency. And so for me, it doesn't really, it, it's not so interesting, honestly to ask the Catholic Church or so, I, I think it is much more appropriate to ask, here, we are a community, we are a university, what is our responsibility? Our responsibility is education. It is, it is information, it is reasoning, it is trying to understand, it, it is hermeneutics. What kind of a narrative do we have here? What can we learn about the, the creatures on their biological level? On, on their chemical level. Also, you know, for example, um, I'm in a working group right now on, on uh, constructing so-called alien organisms, they are just calling them altered organisms, genetically altered organisms, and I'm deeply troubled by that. <coughs> but that is too general. It is my prejudice, maybe, yeah? So I have to study that. I have to listen. I have to, I have to learn before I can actually start even an assessment. That is, for me, much, much, much more interesting, actually, than, than um, asking what the heck is the rich Catholic Church doing. What, what I do need to say, though, is, and, and for example, the sustainability and the buildings of the Catholic Church, that is a different matter. There we should, I think, put as much pressure onto them as we would put onto the politicians. And, and I loved your, I don't know your name, actually, your comment before the break. Yeah, there is an energy bill or an environmental bill right now in Illinois. And, and we can still try to see whether we can put some pressure on this. But in order to do so, I have to compare the, <laughs> the different proposals. And where can we do that if not here? So. Uh, just quickly, one of the really interesting features of this encyclical is the number of references to Episcopal conferences and bishop, bishop groups that he footnotes. Um, there have been popes in the past that have been reluctant to acknowledge the fact that there are bishops' conferences. <laughs> that, um, this one uh, footnotes, I think I counted about 18 different bishop conferences around the world who have been on this issue for 30 years. You know, the, the, um, what is happening to our beautiful land, the, it's a, the uh, Episcopal document by the Filipino bishops in 1980, it's, it's just a stunning, <coughs> heart-wrenching document, and it's you know, 30 years old. So the Catholic Church, you know, what is that? Well, it does include these regional episcopacies that have been really, many of them, quite good, including the German bishops. I mean, I don't know if you agree with me on that, but... But the German, yeah, that, that have been at it for a while. Um, I was uh, struck with Mike's comments about the importance of uh, being in touch with nature and what a prominent theme that is in the, the encyclical. But also Francis's emphasis on uh, right urban design. And um, anyone who's traveled through Europe, we, we, we see a very different urban model, one that uh, is happy to embrace rigorous zoning to protect high density medieval cities, and you, you set out a growth border, and the state of Oregon, in fact, has taken this as a state policy. The whole point of the growth border was accepted by the citizens of Oregon to protect nature and the fields and ranches and the character, the rural character of Oregon. What it did happily was channel development and investment and job creation back inside that border. So Oregon cities get more urban, more dense. But then you can use, so it, it, it allows smaller cities to have close contact with real agricultural areas or woods, whereas the American model, um, more individualistic, we, it's much more difficult to get agreement on zoning, uh, we don't tax gas, so we incentivize auto driving, we have a history of cannibalizing uh, excellent urban transit um, systems, Chicago, 
uh, at the turn of the, at 1900, had one of the largest streetcar networks in the world. We let that reside. And so we've taken policy steps that encourage edge development and sprawl and further sprawl, thus geographically creating a, a bigger spatial barrier between individual urbanites and nature. But happily, we had some important people, Frederick Law Olmsted and others, creating the, what, the golden, the green necklace of parks as an attempt to bring nature to the people. But th this is a very important theme and a distinctive theme in, in the encyclical, it seems to me. I, I comment in one sentence because I think you're so right in, in stressing the, the importance of the mega cities, the cities, the urban planning and so on. But you know, if, if we would take Chicago as an example, and I link that to the sustainable development in, in uh, the fourth chapter as an example, it would mean that the south side, the west side, yeah, would become the example of this city for sustainable development. And they would have their common, their public spaces. They would have the renewable energy. They would have the cheap housing because of the renewable energy, and so on. It is unthinkable for us, I think. Because we think, oh my gosh, energy efficiency is very expensive. You have to own a house for that, or a flat or something. If you want to do renewable energy again, you have, and what happens, it will be the white upper middle class who will start the movement. <coughs> this is exactly the, the kind of thinking that, that, that Pope Francis, in this encyclical, wants to subvert. And starting with a city, a city like Chicago, it would be to propose policies in line of what you what you are saying that actually reverses this vicious cycle here. I think personally, it would be doable. It is a question of will, not about might. I want to pose one more question before we open it up for everyone's thoughts and <coughs> questions. And this is building on uh, the idea of trying to uh, instill this longing for reconnection with the environment and also. Uh, trying to figure out how we can actually get cities to invest in sustainable development. Uh, and pulling it back, back also to the theme of everything that's interconnected. Um, the encyclical asks us to expand, I think, what uh, Susan Offital calls our scope of justice. So it asks us to uh, include not only people who we already value and care about uh, in our own communities, but also uh, the poor and the very environment itself. So that's a really big challenge. How can we get people to uh, expand what they consider to be worthy of fair treatment, including uh, investing in poor communities and giving them these wonderful uh, models of sustainability in, in, to improve their lives? I want to go first because I want to repeat myself. The burden of proof <laughs> is on those who argue for exclusion rather than on them who want to include. And by the way, I consider arguments like that really wrong because it presupposes who the we is. It is the givers. <laughs> that is not automatically the case, okay? So the... the but they have the power in the <laughs> We're talking about how do you want to do that, that is motivation and so on, but what we are talking about here is what would it mean to transform or to reverse, yeah, or to subvert your, your let's say, normal way of thinking, yeah, and, and uh, really, really follow through the consequences of the transformation, I repeat that too, that we actually long for because we are not made for relationships of an, as I call that, I-it. We are made for relationships of an I-thou. How can we be more alienated than we are right now not to, not to enter the conversation uh, like that? I do acknowledge that that is the biggest problem, of course, but I think the argument to, to say, hey, how can you automatically presuppose um, that it is an argument of inclusion rather than of exclusion helps to at least kind of free some, how, how did Anna say that, unfreeze us a little bit. Yeah. If 
I was 30 years younger, what I'd really like to do is ask Susan Ross to give me a leave of absence. <laughs> well, wait a minute. 30 years ago, I wouldn't have to ask you. <clears throat> and I'd really, I'd like to go to New Orleans and study what has happened since Katrina and the, the crisis of politics, the crisis of race, the crisis of, of ecology. It's all there. It's, it, this is like perfect storm <laughs> and I, I, I would I that's what I, I would just try I would I would like to go into that environment to just to try to understand the variables in the real circumstance and and go from there so. <clears throat> I'm gonna go with Mike because I like Dumbo <laughs> uh, your ancestors are also from Dumbo it's been said a lot of uh, across the panels the importance in ethics of focusing attention, and um, it just strikes me that maybe what we haven't been talking about sufficiently is uh, we're an extremely wealthy nation, and it's we've made policy decisions to uh, year after year support massively high military spending. The um, I I've tried to deeply Google the amount of money the United States has spent just on nuclear weapons development. And there, there is a, um, uh, Brookings did a study from 1944 across, I think it was 96. And but why they ended there is weird. But um, I, I called the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists people to see if there's updated study. But just on the building, research and development, sustaining salaries, for nuclear weapons, the United States, across that time frame, uh, spent $5.8 trillion on just the nukes part of our military defense. So it strikes me that another way of arguing, well, A, we have obligations to our citizens. We have obligations to our neighbors, use Christian language. Um, we have obligations to foreigners, Samaritan, uh, healing, you know, the Good Samaritan story is about reaching across ethnic lines. But just the obligations to our fellow citizens. You've got a wealthy class who now pay lower tax rates than we ever did before. During World War II, we thought it was important that the wealthiest Americans pay a tax rate of something like 91%. That's on top of, you know, they're, they're given a cushion, but excess income above a certain line was taken at 91%. Why? Because there was a national crisis. So I think the Pope's sort of saying there's a global crisis, but if we can't respond to a global crisis, maybe we ought to just rename it as, well, let's at least acknowledge it's a national crisis too. So my point is there, there are pools of money that could be leveraged to doing all sorts of really important, equitable things for our, the poor that the Pope is talking about who are in our midst. So the Pope is causing a stir again. Um, some of you may have seen the uh, Zenit. He issued a statement to um, um, to San Digidio. The Pope Francis says that it is violence to build walls to keep out those seeking peace and to widen the gulf between those who have so much they waste what's extra and those who lack what they need. Um, so once again, I mean, this precedes his papal trip to the United States. I have no doubt that this will be politically interpreted in Washington. Um, and so, you know, part of the, the uh, Michael, your, your emphasis on the interconnectedness on all life forms, um, you know, we are going to have this global crisis of migrations. We're going to have the ongoing crisis of ecology and persons on the move. Um, and, and, and not only as a nation, but as a continent, we're going to have to address these issues in an interrelated way because they're not going away. And so I, I just find it interesting, of course, in Europe, when I was the ambassador, they would tell me, well, Mr. Ambassador, it's interesting that we tore down the walls, uh, we tore down a wall that, that, that symbolized for us the divisions in Western, you know, in, in Europe in terms of the Berlin Wall, and you guys are building a wall in the, you know, between the South and, and, your, and your country. And so I, I just, you know, I, I just think that, um, you know, this symbol that the Pope has of, 
of the, what is, has been called the, this, this kind of uh, theology of encounter, you know, it's really, really counter to, to all kinds of separations that, 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 uh, that, uh, that ultimately are against this uh, interconnectedness of all life forms. And so I, I don't know what kind of policies we have to enact, but clearly um, to enact policies that, uh, that work out, out of this model of interconnectedness is the key, but I, you know, I, I yes, I, I think that that's the, uh, the, the, you know, for all of us to, to, to envision, because they're not in place. I mean, we are silos, um, politically, uh, economically, educationally, and everything else. I don't know if you want to comment on I mean, if any of you, you know, especially from the Europeans. <laughs> you know, in, in, in the encyclical letter, the Pope says the civil society is ahead of the politicians. And the the last two weeks or so, three weeks maybe, um, that has in Europe at the moment with the migration of so refugee and migration crisis, uh, that has become very very obvious. Yeah, because I can I'm from Germany. I can can best speak from that, but it's true in Austria and Sweden. Um, unfortunately, not so much in Hungary right now, where a wall is being built and policemen actually. Um, go after the refugees as if they were criminals, yeah? And um, images from last night are really, really most troubling in that situation. However, you have seen probably the, the, the pictures of the main station in Vienna, the main station in Munich, the main station in Berlin, where the people tell the politician to politicians, do you know what? We have had enough. We are compassionate people. And we do first things first. What these people need is clothes and water, and now shelter, and so on and so on. And it took the German government probably six days to do something that they avoided to do all through the last 10 years, but certainly also since spring. They actually said, Merkel said, we, we, need to, we need to kind of deal with this crisis here. And now they are celebrated, of course, but it should be a celebration of the civil society movement. And I think, you know, when we become frustrated with, with the climate change, and I come back to Anna's presentation in the beginning, when we get frustrated, I, I think one should really look at these examples. Will that solve the migration crisis? No, not at all. Policies must follow up. But how do policies, and <laughs> politics change <laughs> through movements, of course. Yeah, it's, you said that this is also about bodies. <coughs> it's not just about intellectual understanding, it is about bodies. You have to go there and give these refugees water or invite them to your home. And many, many, many of my friends and, and acquaintances and so on have done that over the last few days. Open the houses, that is pretty something if you do not speak the language, you have no way of communication, <coughs> complete strangers, and so on. And I think that is, that will not solve the polit political problem. But it, it is a counter narrative to the Hungarian police and politis, po politician. It is counter narrative to the Den Danish right wing government. It is a counter narrative to the UK who agrees to take up 20,000 refugees until 2020 or whatever, 20,000 came over this weekend to Germany. <laughs> For God's sake, what are we talking about? And to call it what it has to be called, I think that will be the legacy of this book. <coughs> be blunt. I was, I, I've been um, kind of a hobbyist in, in um, neuroscience and neurocognitive research, I find it just so fascinating, the area of what we're learning about the brain, and, and I try to think about it in terms of my work in ethics, and, and then, but now I'm thinking about it in terms of spirituality as well, and I, I, <coughs> I read research that says that, you know, an, a, a, an experience that induces gratitude burns off pretty fast. Um, Unless you, unless you engage in really intentional exercises to stay in a spirit of gratitude, what Ignatius would have, you know, this, the exercises of spirituality, to stay in that place of gratitude. Otherwise, I, I guess evolutionarily, they kind of burn off. 
experiences that induce fear stay a long time. And uh, they've done some research on this. It takes an average of about eight opposite experiences to, to kind of to cancel out a, an experience of, uh, of fear. So you, you had a, an experience with someone that has made you fearful. It'll take eight good experiences with that person to, to nullify that. Unless you really work and do spiritual exercises, intentionality to, to kind of work on that. So um, <coughs> on this matter, I think we're full of fear. We're full of fear. And, and what do we do about that from a spiritual point of view? I, I think it's, it's part of the dynamic. Thanks, Laura. Terrific, terrific panelists. Uh, I'm Peter Bernardi, and teaching in the theology department. Um, two uh, brief remarks. Um, Mike, when you showed us the uh, picture of the uh, dead campesinos murdered for their trying to protect their ancestral rights, it reminded me of Dorothy Stang who is another icon for ecological justice. Many of us know she was murdered by paid assassins of wealthy ranchers in uh, Brazil and the Amazon. She had committed her life to be in solidarity with the indigenous peoples there, protect their, their ancestral lands so we can eat more, more Big Macs. They want to, of course, uh, cut down those trees and uh, uh, expand uh, the cattle. Um, that's a first remark. My second remark directed to Bill, and it's uh, a, a, question, or a remark calling for a comment. Um, you've made the connection between ecology and war and the just obscene amount of money that's spent by the U.S. and other governments on implements of war. Um, I believe we have a doctoral student working on a dissertation that I suspect you're involved with, uh, Dan, uh, on war and environment. And uh, I'm reminded uh, that um, Agent Orange in Vietnam uh, destroys the environment, leaves a, a legacy even to, up to today of birth defects. Uh, and then I'm reminded of the depleted uranium weapons that were used in Iraq, the two. I mean, uh, of course, the greatest cost is the suffering and carnage of human lives lost but that these weapons also destroy the environment for generations. So I, I ask your uh, comments on that. Uh, tying in with Mike's point, uh, there's nothing like a war to mobilize the energies of a community. There's, there's no, the, the issue of national security or, or is when it, when it seems to be starkly in front of a community that this is an issue of national survival, um, you, you rally human and financial resources so that anything, uh, the development of weapons get always legitimated to handle this emergency crisis. Um, it saddens me that we seem, well, the, the 20th century prepared Say, just talk about America. You know, we went through World War One, World War Two, Hitler, Cold War. So it's not surprising that we have our fear receptors and we scan the horizon for hostile military threats. And then it's also not surprising when lots of corporations work to sustain that fear posture to maintain the uh, sense of normalcy in Americans, both Democratic and Republican administrations, to sustain, of course, high, vastly high military spending because there are those rogue nations out there. Well, those rogue nations are, we're talking, the North Koreans do not yet have long range missile capability. I mean, they're, they're very modest. It, but then this is being, then put off the table is any notion of genuine security threat through climate change or ecological degradation. We simply haven't, as a nation, had leadership or enough people talking about the analogies across between environmental issues. And so um, it, it's amazing to me the asymmetry of risk assessment 
but it seems to me that the Pope, you know, it's it's a it's a kind of a a game changer that Pope John Paul II focused Catholics' attention on the moral problematics of abortion, on birth control, on homosexuality, and that was those were seen as distinctive areas of Catholic concern. Well, after this encyclical, you got to add climate change on there. So it, it allows a whole new set of, like, progressive Catholics already were concerned about climate change. We didn't need to have a pope tell us what the World Watch Institute has been telling us for 30 years. Um, but for moderate Catholics who are very busy in their ordinary life struggle, when the pope says something, he, he can get an audience that wasn't there yet. And I think the ecologists and the Lester Browns and Bill McKibbins are delighted to have a major religious leader joining the Dalai Lama, joining lots of other religious leaders to flag this to uh, a population that's one-sixth of humanity. May I just quickly add that, that it is not just the the Pope now or the Catholic Church, you know, when, when Kofi Annan actually announced the, the Millennium Goals, whatever became of them, but, but the that, that was countered by another um, initiative on, on human security, and the, it was called human security, because it was tied to the, the Millennium Goals, so, and that was actually, um, um, voted on in, in uh, the United Nations General Assembly, and then 9-11 happened. So part of our job, I think, and as a university is also not only to look for allies, but also to, to analyze the history, even the recent history of where, where certain things went wrong, yeah, or where, where things could have happened differently. And that is why I also think that for example, the Paris uh, summit is important. It cannot just be kind of uh, thrown out of the window or before it has happened. It is important because you know um, it might it might actually be the momentum or the opportunity to to come back to some of these strategies that might actually work. And and with respect to the connection of war and environment, I think one one should really study again what, what uh, Kofi Annan announced, together with, actually was mentioned before, Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia University and so on, and, and Hamar Tiazen, who is, who is a big advocate right now to connect uh, social justice and, and climate change or environmental um, ethics questions. Yeah, So that is, I think, our task here at the university. We have time for maybe one more thought. Um, I was just thinking how, um, Years ago, I just thought that the news hour was the greatest thing going, and I was raising three children and working full time, and I'd listen to the news hour. And um, and then a little later in my life, I um, well, when the Iraq War was when we were beginning to hear rumors, uh, um, and when we heard Bush say, "Oh, it's going to be shock and awe," I was just like, "Whoa!" So I joined a peace organization. And then the peace organization was all about, um, was an anti-nuclear proliferation group, um, but then got very, very involved in anti-war and the military budget. And so, I, I mean, when I joined, I said, oh, I don't know anything about nuclear. And they said, oh, read this book and you'll be 80% of war. <laughs> so to make a long story short, you know, we, we have to be responsible for our own education over time. And I am so grateful for what I learned by becoming active in one organization. Um, it was like maybe two or three years later and I'm going on the news hour, well, he didn't ask this question. He didn't ask that question. The omissions are huge, even in, on NPR and PBS. And I would just like to encourage everybody here to pick up the phone and say to Comcast and say to PBS, you must put Democracy Now! on TV. Because if you watch Democracy Now! for three weeks, I swear to God, you will really get a clear understanding of what we're not, of what, what they're not doing on the major news outlets, and how they are uh, directly and indirectly um, building the fears of Americans to go to the next war. You know, so if you know the media is really very central to this uh, military-industrial complex. 
Um, and then one other thing I just want to share. I went to a meeting years ago, again, with the same organization tutoring me, and a woman at a union meeting stood up and said, everything in our lives is political. Now, I can't tell you how many people in my own family and circle of friends have said to me, oh, well, I, I'm not political, and I never thought much of it. But when she got up and talked, it was like, everything in your life is political. The education you afford or don't, the quality of your food, the safety of your food, the safety of your water, the air quality, everything that's really central to your being it has a political basis. So I would just say we have to encourage our friends. You, nobody has to do it all. Nobody has to do a lot. If everybody would just do an hour or two a week of, of politicizing themselves, educating themselves, you know, we could really move things. I'm very excited about the fact that the people across the country maybe are going to say no to uh, the people who want to stop this Iran deal, you know. People are saying we don't want to go go to war, we do want to try, you know, negotiation. It's very exciting. So we, we have power if we use it. All right, so we're out of time for this panel, but thanks so much to everyone for your contributions. Thank you. My name is Kathleen Moss Weigert. I'm the Carolyn Farrell BBM Professor of Women in Leadership and the Assistant to the Provost for Social Justice Initiatives. And it's my privilege to be the moderator for this session. The program of the whole day is to offer us the opportunity to reflect on the importance of Pope Francis's new encyclical, Laudato Si, with its clear focus on the earth and the necessity of care for our common home and how that relates to us as individuals and as an institution of higher learning. Early in the encyclical, Pope Francis refers to his namesake, St. Francis of Assisi, and says, I quote, he shows us just how inseparable the bond is between concern for nature, justice for the poor, commitment to society, and interior peace, unquote. And later in the document, he notes that he, he's going to use examples that point to the intimate relationship between the poor and the fragility of the planet. The encyclical basically challenges us all to do our part, both as individuals, but also as an institution collectively. That challenge is also part of our Loyalist mission statement and in our new strategic plan called Plan 2020. Let me quote from the opening lines of the introduction to Plan 2020. As a Catholic and Jesuit university, Loyola is guided by a living intellectual tradition. All of Loyola's undertakings, its teaching, research, and service, are infused with a conviction regarding the sacred character of all reality, the dignity of every human person, the mutual informing dynamic between faith and reason, and the responsibility to care for our world, and especially those who are suffering most." Unquote. So this session is about how, as an institution, Loyola is trying to advance the crucial link between care for our common home and the demands of justice. Let me introduce our panelists in the order in which they will speak, and then invite them to speak. I will keep track of the time, and they, they will be held to it, sort of. And then I'll open with some questions, and then we'll open it to all of you for questions as well. Aaron Dernbaugh is our Director of Sustainability. Wayne Marjas is the Senior Vice President for Capital Planning and Campus Management. And Summer Roberts is the Director of Community Relations. I invite Wayne to the podium. Is it okay, is it okay if I sit? Oh, of course, if you want to sit. Oh, I can stand. <laughs> This is just like Stephen Colbert's first show, I think. <laughs> well, thanks. It's great. It's great to be here. Can you, you can hear me without a microphone, can't you? I have a pretty good mouth. Um, yeah, this is a. Uh, yeah. I should know this as a radio person. Thanks, Jim. Mm -hmm. um, it's great to be here, and, and um, I, I must say, when uh, when Michael first uh, asked me to to uh, to attend, uh, the first thought that came to my mind was, Do I have to read the encyclical? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm, but I'm really glad I did because I, I want to start with this one uh, with this one concept that that really resonated 
uh, with me. I've, uh, I've been at Loyola for uh, a long time, for 33 years, and um, there is a nugget uh, toward the final third of uh, Pope Francis's encyclical that talks about this idea of, uh, of a social mortgage on all private property. And as soon as I read that, I said, wow, I've, I've never thought about what we do uh, at Loyola and what specifically uh, I and my team do in our department as, as really managing this concept of a social mortgage. And what he means by that, if you recall that section of the encyclical, is that we have a responsibility that while we may be private property owners, be it in our own house, owning our own land, or whatever it may be, Whatever we do with that in order to, what he calls, you know, to care for and till that property uh, is really, uh, it really has with it a social dimension. And it's incumbent upon us, if we are going to develop as fully human, virtuous people, to be able to recognize that and, and, and manage it going forward. And it never occurred to me that so much of what we do here at Loyola in addressing uh, the multitude of projects that have gone on, especially over the past 13 years, not in a vacuum, but mindful of our neighbors, our neighbors internally, our students, our faculty, our staff, our alumni, and certainly our neighbors in the surrounding communities uh, in which we live at the Lakeshore campus, Water Tower campus, and Health Sciences campus. We spend a lot of time um, in what we do, and, and some uh, may not fully appreciate it, uh, managing expectations and working with those uh, to be sure that we're true to that idea of social mortgage. So I, I wanted to start with that because I think a lot of what you will hear today relative to what Summer does in her work uh, in the community and what Aaron uh, kind of, Aaron's our, like our sustainability conscience here at Loyola, uh, and what Aaron will talk about in our climate action plan really ties back to, I think, this idea of being responsible citizens and being socially aware of uh, what we do with the assets and the resources uh, we have um, here on Earth. Uh, it, there's no secret to any of you that have been here for some time that we have been uh, on somewhat of a uh, campus building spree over the past 13 years under the leadership of uh, Father Garanzini, if you looked at the Lakeshore campus from the air in 2003, and you took a look building by building as to those buildings that would be by what's called ASHRAE standards, energy efficient or at least uh, 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 smart buildings, there would be one. And believe it or not, that one would have been the humanities, the Crown Center for the Humanities. Spin the clock to 2008, and 50% of the buildings on this campus would have had uh, a, 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 a green rating. Uh, till today, all but four buildings, you could probably guess what they are, uh, don't have a green rating. So we've made tremendous progress here in uh, harnessing not only our location here at the, at the campus and the environment in which we are, but also uh, I would hope and think that, that many of us appreciate being good stewards of the resources that we have. And we've done it in three ways. We've done it with our campus infrastructure, we've done it with our, our campus renovations, and we've done it with uh, new construction. And, and, and the new construction I'll come to in a minute, but we're sitting in really the uh, jewel in the crown of new construction in the uh, Clarjet Information Commons. Um, let me start with infrastructure. Um, back in 2003, uh, in 2004, we began the process of redesign for our campus heating and cooling plan. And one of the things we began to think about and work with our uh, external consultants and experts on is how can we take our location here right at, the, at, at Lake Michigan, right at the shores of Lake Michigan with the wind currents and the water and everything else and be able to harness as much as that energy as possible uh, in a smart way that will allow us to become much more energy efficient on this campus. And we kept coming back to the fact that we would have to start with a rebuilding of our central plant by changing the way we deliver our heating and cooling to our various buildings throughout the campus and do it in a way where we would be able to at least meet, but hopefully exceed, the consumption standards that would be uh, in place for buildings in the size of our campuses uh, as we were at the time. To the point where, and I don't want to get too technical, but I'm happy to answer questions later, to the point where uh, we consume uh, a, a, about 66% less in the aggregate from all energy sources uh, on this campus across all of our buildings. Now granted, some are much more efficient and even, uh, even beat that record like the building that we're in right now, 
Uh, some are less efficient, like uh, Cudahy Science, which is now adorned with scaffolding as the dome gets replaced. Um, but in the aggregate, that's a, that's a pretty um, uh, uh, impressive, and, and we know now, because a lot of the major projects that we've been accomplished over the past 13 years are coming to closure, uh, it's also a sustainable number. So uh, that was the first thing we tackled, is our infrastructure and how we deliver our heating and cooling uh, to our buildings. The second thing we did is we looked at uh, existing buildings. And my favorite example is uh, the Mundelein Center, uh, uh, BVM Hall. Uh, the the Mundelein Center building, uh, which was uh, acquired by us in 1991 when we affiliated with Mundelein College, uh, is a building that is on the National Registry of Historic Places. It's a building that has 14 roofs. And when we first um, acquired the building in 1991, our instinct as was the instinct of a lot of uh, institutions at the time. And it kind of goes back to what we saw in the 70s and 80s, where you believed you had an energy efficient building. If you sealed all the windows as tightly as possible, you didn't let any the outside air in. That's what we went about doing. So in 1991 and 1992, we replaced the window systems. We redid the exterior skin of the building. But then we went on the inside. And what started off as being a two-year project turned out to be a nine-year project to the tune of about $65 million. But today, what we really have is an example of a, um, an old building that has been able to demonstrate some pretty amazing energy uh, statistics on its own. Uh, one of the things we did in uh, the Mundelein Center is we equipped the building with, what, with what's called a heat recovery system. And what that allows uh, the heating system in a building like Mundelein to do is recover the heat, especially in the wintertime, of the inside air and while pulling air from the outside, heat it using the, uh, the, the ambient temperature from the inside air. So creating fresh air that is warm, that doesn't require as, as much energy to actually heat as if you were starting from, uh, from scratch and taking outside air and heating it to a, an inside temp temperature. Uh, we did a whole bunch of other things on Mundelein, but it's an example today of the commitment that we've made as an institution all the way up to our Board of Trustees and certainly uh, at the encouragement of, of our former president, Father Mike Garanzini, to, uh, to embrace uh, new technology and, uh, and make it work for us um, uh, in advancing our agenda for, uh, uh, for, for energy efficiency. And then lastly, uh, new construction. Uh, this building is, uh, as I indicated before, one of the smartest buildings on campus. The, um, Dr. Tuckman's home, the uh, Institute for Environmental Sustainability, is um, the largest geothermal uh, building in the city of Chicago. Um, it has, um, now that it's been operational for over a year, starting to generate some pretty significant data on how it performs. Uh, I, I, I can uh, confidently say that the models that we run with our engineers on how certain buildings will perform relative to their energy consumption before they're built uh, have been exceeded in some cases two and threefold after the buildings are actually up and running. So uh, we're getting a lot better at um, monitoring and assessing how we're doing on our new construction. And when we make uh, institutional commitments like we did 13 years ago to only build uh, at a minimum of Silver Elite certified, we begin to see the benefits of that not only uh, here at this campus but across our, um, our Chicagoland campuses. Um, Besides the energy savings, besides the goodwill that this is all generated, I just want to end with this thought, and that is uh, all of what we have done here at Loyola to uh, accomplish in the past 13 years this dramatic step forward in um, responding to many of the, uh, the points that uh, are made in this encyclical have generated an, uh, an immeasurable amount of goodwill uh, not only with our neighbors in our surrounding uh, campus areas, but also in the broader city of Chicago and the state of Illinois. Um, everybody we, we talk to and interface with um, has recognized that we have made an institutional commitment to this area in such a way that it's not only making a difference here at Loyola, but other institutions are coming to see what we have done and are trying to replicate it, ask questions on how they could do it and how they begin to, can, can begin to advance um, uh, an agenda such as this. So uh, it, it's clearly um, been a, a, a wonderful 13-year run. Uh, it's clearly been core to our uh, commitment and our um, tradition as a Catholic and Jesuit institution. 
It's gratifying to uh, read this encyclical by a, 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 a very exciting uh, pontiff who really has resonated well with much of what we have talked about here at the university, both at uh, the management level, within our students, our faculty, and staff. Uh, so it's been, it's been very gratifying. I know uh, others around the table share that, uh, that sentiment. It's a springboard, I think, and a challenge for us for the future on what we do for the next 13 years. Uh, that those chapters have not yet been written, but uh, stay tuned, there's more to come. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Summer Roberts, I'm from Loyola's Department of Community Relations. I have the distinct pleasure of working in Wayne's division, and one of, um, community relations primary goal is to be able to connect all of these amazing things that the university is doing with our campus partners and engaging them in meaningful ways to be sort of a part of you know the strides that the university is making but then we're also very blessed in that um, we're in, in, embedded in communities that also share our, our goals and our visions for the neighborhood and so both in Rogers Park Edgewater and I would say also down, down at the Water Tower campus in Streeterville, we have some extremely engaged partners that are not only um, places where our students can do their research, um, provide wonderful service and learning opportunities for our students, but that are also doing some really amazing things to make their communities more sustainable. And so we have been able to, I would say over the last maybe 10 years or so, um, be, be working together and be part of this sort of collective movement, this collective consciousness, I think, that we're, that we're all a part of as it relates to our planet and the sense of stewardship, right, to, to planet Earth. And so a lot of what we've been doing in community relations over the last 10 years is sort of finding out what those opportunities are as we're building awesome new buildings. We're wanting to bring the community in to kind of see some of the things that we're doing. Um, and, and to be able to take away um, some of the research or best practices and apply those things in their, in their own neighborhoods. And in addition to that, I mean, there's, there's sort of sustainability at the biggest level, but then there's also sustainability in our homes, right, in our, in our, in our own backyards. And so we've been focused on some ways that we can create some joint programming and learning opportunities where we can not only just bring people on campus, but we can go off campus and help people build their own community gardens or um, make their homes more efficient. So we've done things over the years like host sustainability workshops where people can come in and kind of see some of these models in action. Um, we've also worked with like local parks and local libraries to get some of our awesome students who are doing amazing research out there um, having an opportunity to present the things that they've learned and the research that they've done with larger communities. Edgewater, which is our neighborhood just to the south of us, um, has a whole sustainability plan for their community. That plan was created back in 2007 um, with the research of Loyola students. So there was about 5,000 hours of Loyola student research that actually went forward to create Edgewater's sustainability plan. And, it, and then they're making, as they're making progress over this plan, more and more our students are getting engaged at every level. Um, to make that community more sustainable, and they've been a, a, an amazing partner. Um, we just opened the uh, St. Ignatius Community Plaza, right? It's, it's in the center of our sustainability corridor, and that has been a, just an amazing addition to the community on so many levels. Not only is it creating this additional green space and play space, but now we have signage out there, which is amazing. It's teaching people how, why this is special. You know, this is a pretty place to walk. It's a pretty place to live, but it's more than just pretty. It's, it's um, making the neighborhood more sustainable. It's making our world more sustainable. And we are now doing better education about some of those things. And people are coming onto campus kind of thanking, you know, thanking Loyola for, for the educational opportunities that we're creating, and we want to do more of that. About six years ago, our office organized something that was called the Lake, North Lakeshore Earth Day. And it, it was kind of an incredible experience 
because what it did was brought together all of the environmental organizations in Uptown Edgewater, Ravenswood, Rogers Park, uh, West Ridge, um, even Lincoln Square. And I brought about a thousand people to campus. And what they did once they got here was participate in best practices workshops. They learned how to start their own community gardens. They learned um, about um, how to recycle and um, how to compost and how to do these things in, in their own home. And we did this for about five years. Um, and it was a great learning opportunity. And now we're kind of branching out and doing more different kinds of outreach. But I think the important thing from, from my perspective is that this is sort of a two-way street. Um, Loyola doesn't exist in a vacuum. And so it's really, um, our success is really dependent upon the, the, the success around us, right? And if, and if we're leading the way, we're bringing our community along with us. We're learning from them, they're learning from us, and that's really kind of the, the whole idea behind the, at least the work that I do and what I'm really passion, passionate about. Um, and then finally, there's the whole community service aspect, direct service to the community. So we have our students out there who have their own passions and their own intentions and really want to kind of roll up their sleeves. And so we do a number of community service opportunities where they're, they're out on the beaches. They're um, part of the dune restoration project that's happening to the north along the lakefront. They're, um, they're growing their own vegetables. They're working with neighbors and creating their own communities right here off campus. And so, so, so oftentimes people forget that you know our students, they're living here. They're not just on campus, but they're living in these neighborhoods. And they really kind of own it while they're here. And, th and that's what we encourage in our students is that sort of independence and, and that spirit of community. Um, and so as, as we continue to evolve, I think our, our neighborhoods are continuing to evolve. Um, for the first time this year, we just launched a community action scholarship. So now we're able to raise money um, from our community partners and give that money to a student who can then turn around and do a really exciting community project. This year we just um, chose a student, Marina Garcia. I don't know if Marina is here. She probably should be. It would be great to have her here. Um, because Marina is, is planting milkweed in the community and she's working with community partners and schools and helping them learn the importance of milkweed as a butterfly habitat and um, creating these garden sites all around the neighborhood um, that will hopefully you know, bring the monarch butterfly back to, the, back to its native lab habitat. Um, and we want to do more of this. This is the first year, so she's our first recipient. But I hope to grow this scholarship program and um, create more opportunities for Loyola students to really do this sort of direct engagement. And it's really been because of the support of the Institute for Environmental Sustainability and all of their knowledge that they have there that we're even able to make this happen. And so these community partnerships and, and university-wide partnerships are really kind of, I think, leading the way in terms of how we're sort of in, enacting um, what, the, what the Pope has asked of us. And I think we're, we're embodying it every single day in the work that we do. So, thank you. I'm just going to use the, this one up here. So, um, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron Dernbaugh. I'm the Director of Sustainability uh, here at Loyola. And before I start, let me just thank uh, the folks who helped organize this. Obviously, Mike Murphy, all the presenters today. I know there's lots of students and others who have pitched in um, to make all the proceedings today a success. So, let me just give you a word of thanks. And um, so, I get the great honor over the next 15 minutes to share with you something that was developed over about the last uh, 10 months, uh, maybe maybe almost a year, um, but we've been working on it, as you just heard from uh, Wayne and Summer's presentation, for quite a, quite a bit of time, we're working up to it, um, and, and that's Loyola's Climate Action Plan. So this was adopted over the summer. Um, it went through a whole process. You'll see some of the uh, timeline related to the process. But it is a very big um, accomplishment for the university. And it's also a big commitment. Uh, I don't want to downplay that. There are definitely actions and um, goals listed in this plan that will take you know, 
many of us pulling together to, to do. It's not something that we or the administration or the IES or one unit can go just into a, a room and, and, and get it done. We, we'll, we'll be asking ourselves these questions and uh, looking at how far we've progressed over the next couple of years um, to really understand what we're doing well and what we need to put more attention to. So, um, so I'm really excited. Uh, this is an exciting day for me um, that we can publicly share our climate action plan. You all should have received on your seat or in a seat near you sort of a summary of what's in the plan. But for more detail, there is actually, and there's a, a link at the bottom, there is actually a PDF available online that would get you to this document, but this was kind of expensive to print, so we didn't print very many of these, plus it sort of uh, defeats the purpose. Um, so, uh, so those are available if you want to look at it and get into more detail. Of course, um, over the course of the conversation for the next uh, half hour or 40 minutes, we can also get into some of the details. But let me take you through a little journey of how we got to uh, those goals and, and this commitment to be carbon neutral by 2025. Former President Father uh, Michael Garanzini signed Loyola on to what's the President's climate commitment. This is a significant uh, commitment. Over 600 schools are participating in the President's climate commitment. It lines out these, these goals that you see at the bottom, these commitments that a university needs to take. So we've signed, been signed on to this since 2012. Things like doing our annual greenhouse gas emissions inventory, which we've done with students over the last number of, number of years. Um, Things like taking some specific actions, some of the ones you heard, like having some green building policies and other things like that. But then that first one, the development of a comprehensive plan to achieve climate neutrality is really what we're talking about right now. We also wanted to ask you, ask the Loyola community, what should we be doing on this topic? We ask and survey, and thank you very much if you fill out my surveys, I appreciate it, because it helps me uh, know where you want us to go. But Specifically on climate change, we asked a couple questions. We asked, you know, what should we be doing to address climate change? And you can see, um, set a goal for greenhouse gas reduction was the most popular one with advance a climate action plan, kind of a similar one right there behind it. But then we also saw these big themes. We have received over 400 comments related to climate change when we did this survey. And you see things like an a misunderstanding or a lack of understanding on the basic climate science, not really sure what an individual or a group of individuals and organization can do to address climate change. And just this need to have a plan and have goals that we'll be working towards. These kinds of were the themes that we saw. Um, this entire survey and all the results on this and many other sustainability topics are available on the IES website if you ever want to look at that. So we pulled together, because we had this commitment and we had this interest from the, bo the body, we pulled together a task force to work on developing a climate action plan. And one thing that came up, and I don't remember if it was the first meeting or the second meeting, but it came up really strongly how, how much we needed to align this with our social justice mission. Um, when we started talking about that, these themes of climate and social justice kind of came forward, I guess, in two main themes, two sub-themes. Um, one of them is that we contribute to climate change. We have a negative influence. Our pollution, our carbon pollution, is added to the atmosphere, it causes extreme weather, it causes all the impacts, all the fears that we see related to climate change. We are a direct contributor. That's a negative, right? Generally a, a negative, right? On the other hand, let's put the, we can be a positive. With our actions, with our campuses, with our students, our graduates, our alumni, our research, we can be a positive contributor to solving that problem. We can find ways to help address climate change if we work with our students and give them the tools. So we sort of talked about how can we have this negative side, our emissions, our carbon pollution, and this positive side, our research, our students, our graduates, our community engagement, these kinds of things. And so we sort of were weighing both of those as a task force as we were talking about the plan. Um, the other thing we knew, which was being developed around the same time, of course, was the uh, Plan 2020, which Kathleen mentioned. And we thought, well, how can this reflect or support or augment what's being planned for the next five years? And that was part of our discussion. This was a pretty streamlined process. Um, this is the list of the folks who were the, the working group. Um, they're also available on, in the plan, so you don't need to jot them down or anything. Or if anybody wants this presentation, I'd be happy to share it. Um, but you can see a lot of folks from operational units, but also student representation and, and some research. Um, this was our schedule. It was, like I said, it was pretty streamlined. It went pretty fast. Um, I want to thank Wayne and the other members of the administration for really supporting us. Um, Nancy and I 
knew we needed to develop a climate action plan, but we also knew we had a, a timeline to do this. As part of the President's climate commitment, we had a timeline dictating when we had to have our plan done and when we had to have it reported up to the President's climate commitment. So, so this went pretty quickly, but the steps that I'll just bring your attention to are not only the meetings that the task force had where we identified and debated different <coughs> actions, but also some little <coughs> sub uh, conversations. So we met with our engineers to talk about some of the specific energy goals for our buildings. Are those achievable over the next 10 years? given how much we've done, how far we've come, you know, how much further can we go. We also had, um, of course, a process going through the University Senate, presenting to the University Cabinet, and ultimately it being adopted by the President. Um, so you can see some of the, the stats there, but it was voted on by the Senate, um, and then it was uh, pushed forward or, or moved forward by the Cabinet, and then finally published to the President's Climate Commitment in June of this summer. Um, so what were we doing? Here's our greenhouse gas emissions. You can see it in a slightly prettier version right there um, at the bottom of the first page. But we have about an 80,000 uh, metric ton uh, footprint each year, carbon footprint. Now, is that a lot or a little? I guess it depends. It depends on, of course, where you are in the world. It depends on where your fuel sources are for your electricity. It depends on how many students you have, how many square foot you have. All of those things are things we have to take into mind when we, when we sort of figure out our greenhouse footprint, but it, and that's good to know, it's good to know and it's good to engage students, it's a great research opportunity to talk about um, what is our greenhouse footprint, what is carbon pollution, we've had student groups break off and do projects related specifically to LURAC, to Cuneo Mansion, to the athletics department and the travel related to athletics, we've had all these little sub projects under, under our carbon work, but um, I think the point is that we all want it to be smaller, right? We all want to reduce our greenhouse gases because of what I said before around social justice. This is our contribution to, uh, to climate change, to global climate change. Our process as a group was really to look at these things and then consider what are the actions that we could take? What are ways we could, we had a discussion earlier this morning at one of the presentations about energy efficiency. So energy efficiency is often referred to as your best cost solution because it's usually much more cost effective to reduce your consumption of energy then to start investing into renewables or sequestration or, or other strategies. So we looked at that first, what could we do? We then looked, okay, so if we could get more efficient over the next 10 years, we're not gonna get down to zero with energy efficiency. That would mean we would never use any energy, heat or cool our buildings, turn on the lights, any, that, that's not gonna happen. What can we do with renewable energy? What are the opportunities um, either off campus where we purchase our energy off campus? Last year there was a student project where she worked with facilities to buy all the energy for the residence halls, all the electricity for the residence halls from clean power. Many people have seen that blue banner on Denobly Hall that's facing Sheridan, it's got a wind turbine on it, it says Loyalist Halls or Fueled by Clean Energy. That was a student project last year as part of our sustainability fund, the Green Initiative Fund. So can we do more of that? Can we buy more of our electricity from clean power? Then we looked at, well, what are opportunities on campus? We know we have opportunities. The, the economics of clean energy are changing all the time. So what could it look like to put solar on our rooftops or put small wind on our campus? Or um, Some of those things are very feasible today. Others may be a little longer term um, strategies that we have. But we wanted to make a commitment that we would consider that if feasible and install it on campus. So we, we talked about that. We then realized that, okay, so we're only going to get so far with any of those strategies I mentioned. So what are carbon offsets? What can we look at as ways to support projects that are doing what we want to be doing, reducing our carbon footprint, when we can't get down to zero on this campus, or we're limited at least in the, the timeline we're looking at? And we also looked at sequestration, which is really how do we capture carbon right here with our landscapes. So you'll see that in a second, some of those numbers, but it's, needless to say, it's very modest. We don't have, you know, a thousand acre forest out behind our campus, at least I haven't seen it, um, uh, at where we could suddenly sort of start large scale sequestration efforts. Um, we of course also wanted, and at this time we know climate change is happening, we have lots of good science to show us what we've observed but also what we forecast over the next 50 to 100 years, so we wanted to make sure our campus was prepared. We're doing a lot of things today, I'll, I'll share those in a second, but we wanted to do, understand that a little bit more. We certainly wanted to make sure the teaching, research, and engagement activities that we have on campus are really embracing climate change and talking about that, maybe getting at some of that uncertainty around climate science that we, we heard about in that survey. Um, and then we sort of talked about ownership. So which of these emissions 
do we own as an institution, and which really are individually owned by each of you and the choices you make every day. And that's, there are some protocols that help guide us along that path, but some of that is still a little bit of a debate, and probably a debate going forward. There's things we can do with our infrastructure, and there's things that really it's up to the individual to do to help us meet some of these goals. Um, so these are our goals. This is the big, you know, the, the big thing. You find it on the back here on the top. And then the sort of target there at the bottom, that chart right there. But it's split in, in two halves. The top half or the top three are really about reducing the emissions. Like I said, the sort of negative carbon pollution that our campus um, is, is developing. And then the next three are really about the engagement side, about what are we doing and how can we make sure climate awareness is really raised here on campus over the next 10 years. Um, I won't go through all these actions in detail if we have questions later, but I, I will just list them. There's a series of energy efficiency actions. Um, if you do pull up the PDF, they're way in the back, uh, sort of in an appendix right here. Um, so you can look at all these actions, but you see things like setting an energy use goal by building type. We looked at all of our buildings, all the existing buildings, and put them into different cohorts based on their age and their use, right? A residence hall is very different than an academic building. A building that's 70 year old, years old is very different than a building that's 10 years old. And so we sort of set goals, energy goals related to that. And um, we're working with you know, facilities is really taking that on as some goals for the buildings. How can we go in and maybe uh, some of the buildings, maybe not some of the really um, Cadillac buildings that we have, the great new construction buildings or even existing buildings that have had a lot of work done, but maybe some of the ones that have been overlooked, how can we go back into those and make sure they're performing the way we want? We don't have a very big vehicle fleet here at Loyola, so the vehicle fleet efficiency goals are pretty modest. Um, green purchasing policy is something really exciting that the purchasing department's ready to jump in on. Uh, water efficiency goal, we do a pretty good job with water consumption, but there's more we can do there. Uh, temperature set policy is something that we have standards that we abide by when we set the temperatures for the different spaces, but could that be more of a policy that we could implement across campus? An equipment trade-in program, I don't know if any of you work in or around labs or other areas that have lots of energy using equipment, but we can maybe help incentivize folks to get things out that are really energy intensive. We've done that on a, on a couple fronts, like in the kitchens and other places, but we haven't really gone into labs and started engaged, engaging the faculty or the staff there. Um, An anti-idling policy, there's a citywide policy around that, but we don't have one on our campus right now. And then energy efficiency behavior program. I mentioned there's so far we can go with our infrastructure, but it's really about a lot of individual decisions. How can we engage more of all of you in making our, our campus uh, reduce its energy load? For on-site renewables, certainly we don't want to leave any stone uh, unturned, but we know that solar thermal, which is heating water using the sun, photovoltaics, which is generating electricity using the sun, and small wind, which are very small turbines, usually mounted on a building, or maybe on a tower, kind of depends on the layout, may all be feasible here on this campus. Um, different levels, and we certainly don't want to, you know, um, we want to put them in a, in a very thoughtful way, but there's certainly a lot of interest in this. I probably get emails around topics like this every day from students or faculty on our campus on why haven't we done this and when are we going to do it. We've got some great feasibility studies that have been accomplished, but you know, it's just a matter of time before we can implement these things. Um, I mentioned carbon sequestration. Uh, this is one of the areas that we've been able to have a uh, great partnership with some faculty actually inventorying trees on this campus at LUREC and uh, inventory from Cuneo Hall where we looked at how much carbon is actually being sequestered by those trees each year. Just to put this in, in a little bit of, um, of scale, remember I said our campus emits about 80,000 metric tons every year and we only sequester, I can't add up those ranges quickly in my head, but it's certainly less than 100. So we are, we're not going to plant our campuses up at a level where we're going to sequester all of our emissions, but it's good to know that we can have positive, um, you know, sort of carbon sequestering opportunities right here on this campus. I want to mention one other project, and this is a project uh, I've been working on with Michael Agliardo, and, oh, oh, hold on, it's right there. Uh, I'll come back to that other slide. And that's actually looking at carbon offset opportunities elsewhere in the world. This is something that we've been working on and developing and, and shopping around with uh, different members of the Loyola community, what their thoughts are around this. But this is specific to air travel. Again, this is a little bit more on the individual level and the individual action, but whether it's a student, a faculty member, a staff person, um, 
giving them an opportunity to offset their air travel. There's quite a bit of emissions from uh, getting in an airplane. Um, and, but on the other hand, we really want to support our students, whether it's in their study abroad experience or their research experience, um, being able to travel and have that. So is there an opportunity to support projects, either locally or somewhere in the world? There's a number of Jesuit projects in South Asia that we've identified that we are hoping to partner with and potentially uh, send some of our funding to help support them, whether it's a sustainable ag project uh, or a reforestry project or something along those lines. I did want to mention some two kind of specific things which are called out in the plan, and that's renewable energy credits and carbon offsets. Um, renewable energy credits are really the way that you know that you're getting clean energy. Because we don't have a pipe leading this, or a, a wire leaving this campus and going straight to a wind turbine, or straight to our solar panels on our roof, the only way you can really claim the environmental benefit of clean energy is by buying the renewable energy credits as well as the electricity. So this is something we've done in the past. We've done it for buildings like this. I mentioned that student's project where she bought it for Res Life for all, all the electricity the residence halls have used. But we need to look at this and consider this. You can see here's a list of some of the campus purchases. Um, you see uh, some of our friends like Georgetown and Northwestern listed right there. And they're making very significant purchases, electricity purchases along solar and wind and other, other resources. This is something that you know, over the next couple of years I think we'll be looking at and considering um, pretty significantly. So that's sort of the mitigation side. That's our emissions. That's how we try to reduce that 80,000 closer to zero. Um, but let's not forget about climate adaptation. We've seen a lot of the impacts of climate change already, whether it's with extreme weather, extreme precipitation, um, extreme heat. These are just some images, some flooding out at uh, O'Hare. That image on the top is actually from the 1995 heat wave here in Chicago, where over 700 people died. Um, or this concrete buckling uh, just up in a north suburb. So we see the, the impacts of extreme heat, but we're already doing a lot actually to make the, this campus more resilient or more adaptive to climate change. Whether it's how we manage our stormwater, um, those signs that Summer mentioned are a big part of sort of showcasing all the good work we're doing there. Um, the, uh, whether it's how we make sure everyone here is more resilient and aware if we have extreme weather, if a storm comes in, or we may have extreme heat, using our loyal alert program to make sure everyone's aware of that and is being safe. Um, but also things like uh, making our ecosystems more resilient, the restoration work we do out at LURAC at the Retreat and Ecology Campus, um, how we consider climate, future climate, uh, into our big capital projects going forward. Is there a process like that? Um, can't forget teaching and research. We have lots of faculty, a couple of them are called out in this document, um, who are doing incredible work on climate-related topics. Uh, so we need to really lift them up and, and celebrate them, but also make sure uh, that information is clearly communicated and shared with each other to see that that's an opportunity. Um, but also, if there's an opportunity to do that research right here on our campus, it's something I like to, to, to look for. Um, we also are looking for ways to partner with folks like the Office of Research Services and others to, to otherwise support uh, the climate, incorporating climate change into their research. Um, we also want to make sure we continue to be accountable and communicate the work we're doing on climate change. Um, like I said, we do annual greenhouse gas inventories. We're going to keep doing that. Um, but how do we then communicate that out? You can look back and see all of our greenhouse gas inventories going back to 2008 on our website to see how we're doing better or worse. Um, the short answer is we're doing better. You can see that in, in some of these charts. But we need to communicate that better. We need to share that information more. And we need to find one place where people can go and find that information and really use it, um, maybe incorporate it in their research, in their teaching, or, or otherwise. Um, sort of in a visual sense, here's what that goal looks like. Uh, scope one and two are really related to energy use in our buildings. Those are the ones we're targeting. Those are the ones we've taken ownership as a university around. Those are the ones we would like to get to carbon neutrality by 2025. That's our goal. Um, scope three are the ones where it's much more about individual actions. It's about the commuting choices you make every day. It's about those air travel choices, um, a, a couple other things. But um, they, those, we still have some goals. We have some resources we want to reduce. But uh, the, our, our goals for reduction for those are much more modest because we have much, more, much less direct impact or control over those. So here's that summary again of what those actions look like. You have them right in front of you, so I won't uh, belabor the fact. But it's a really exciting thing to be able to announce that we have these goals for the university for the next 10 years. And um, 
I'm going to turn it back over to Kathleen so she can uh, facilitate a little bit of a conversation with the rest of the time we have. So now it's your turn. If you have a question, a question, not a paragraph, a question, if you could address it to the person you have in mind, we'll see if we can manage this. Do they need the mic in order to hear this? You are wonderful. So, questions? Hi, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. I want to ask some questions about these figures, specifically as they relate to this main goal of reduce total energy use by 10%. And I want to bring up two points. One is that, from my understanding, these figures don't take into account all of Loyola's campuses. From my understanding. Uh, they're the Lakeside camp. Oh, actually, no, they are Lakeside and Lurac and Cuneo. They're not health science. So not health science, not the School of Medicine, not the yeah. Rome Center. Uh, yeah, not the Rome Center, yeah. Um, and the second thing is, in these figures, they don't seem to take into account the fact that Loyola continues to expand. We just built a 10-story business school. Next spring, we're opening a 239,000 square foot research facility. The Rome Center is expanding. So my question is, in concrete terms, what does this number really mean? What does reduce total energy use by 10% really mean? That's a great question. Um, so uh, really, that's, a, that's a great question. So the 10% total energy use is really specific because what we were able to do with our engineers and with the facilities department is really look at the lakeside campuses specifically, but certainly LURAC will get well below a 10% energy reduction. Um, CUNY is a different, a different beast, but um, the, uh, I don't know how far I want to go into health science division um, because that's a, its own ball of wax. Um, but the, uh, specifically that 10% energy reduction is about all the 4.1 million square feet which is on the Lakeshore campus and the Water Tower campus. And it's broken out even further, um, it's actually here as well as a resource, um, by those cohorts that I mentioned. So by age of building, by use of building, and then it has energy use intensity goals. So it includes both natural gas and electricity, the two main energy sources we use, by those cohort go goals. Yeah, and actually, actually your question, there you go. Your question actually resonates with, with uh, something that that, um, uh, that I got from our board of trustees at, at a finance committee meeting a couple a couple months ago. And the trustee asked, wait a minute, you know, what's going on with all these numbers? I'm looking at uh, the utilities budget for the lakeside campuses overall, and it's not going down, it's going up. And if you look at it, we're doing a lot, we're doing a lot of new construction, doing a lot of renovations, but what does, what does this really mean? So one of the things we've, um, we, we, we watch, at least in the facilities area, is, um, for lack of a better description, gross consumption numbers based on the number of square footage that we have on campus. So round figures, don't quote me on this, but I'm probably within a couple hundred thousand square feet. At this campus alone, uh, we heat and cool the equivalent of uh, two and a half John Hancock centers. Two and a half giant. That's a, that, that's, uh, that's a lot of square footage. It, it's uh, it's over 1.9 million square feet, almost two million square feet. And one way we have to measure consumption, for example, uh, of of cooling capacity, is by um, what's called cooling tons per square foot. The, the national average of what it would take, or, or how many square feet you could cool with a ton of cooling power. It's a it's a, a measure like a like a therm is 500 is 300 square feet we cool about 530 square feet on this campus so you're right we've been growing we've been doing a lot of things not only on the infrastructure side as i mentioned but also within individual buildings but what we do watch is not necessarily the the overall numbers because there is a savings per square foot but more importantly we look at at, at those measures which allow us to really uh, hone in on the efficiency of the energy that we are using based on the gross square footage of our campuses because it has grown considerably. And the medical center 
is a, a, a different animal, not only because it's a medical center and a health sciences campus, but uh, also because, uh, in all honesty, since we sold our hospital to Trinity Health now three years ago, we've yet to finish, but we're getting there, we've yet to completely finish separating all of our utilities for just the health sciences campus. We should be finished with that by the first quarter of next year. When we do, we'll have a better handle on how that campus as a health sciences campus is performing. So specific to the greenhouse gas footprint, um, once we are disconnected from the rest of the hospital, we'll be able to track our utility consumption out of health science, and then that will be added in to our total greenhouse gas footprint going forward. But we'll still have a 10% reduction even with everything new that you add? I mean, that's not in the, the goal because as an energy efficiency goal, that's actually a, a campus where we're doing quite a bit of energy conservation work right now. So we have baseline numbers because we've made those investments. So we will certainly be getting well above a 10% energy reduction out of health science, but it's not included in that goal. We can move on. A question in the back. Thank you for your presentations. And you, uh, I'm Anna Vegan. I teach Christian ethics in the Department of Theology. Uh, it, I'm so proud of this university. And I feel that we are such a good neighbor. I'd like to hear more about how we are also wanting to be a good citizen in terms of uh, public advocacy. I've gone with you, Summer, to Green Lobby Day down with some students in a van to Springfield to, yeah. to communicate. And you didn't mention that today. I don't think I didn't even mention it. So, I, I guess I'm wondering, to, I would especially uh, uh, Wayne Majors and, and Summer, to hear from you well, how you see our role in terms of being in a public voice, uh, policy advocacy with legislators at the state level, at the national level. Um, I know that um, no Notre Dame is hosting a huge conference on climate investing at the end of the month. Boston College is doing a really big thing on a summons call to action. Georgetown has looked at its um, investments in coal and has made some changes as, as another Catholic school, the University of Dayton. Where are we in terms of being a public voice and presence in this um, social and political landscape? That, that's a great question. And you did mention Green Lobby Day. I think that was one of the first initiatives that at least our office was a part of in terms of bringing students and neighbors down to Springfield, working with the Illinois Environmental <laughs> Council to um, lobby for specific bills um, that were that were before the House, the Illinois House and the Illinois Senate, um, environmental bills. And we've done that now two years in a row. We've sort of piloted it the first year to kind of see how it would work and if there was a lot of student interest, and there was, and then we've done it now two years in a row and it seems to be growing. And it's a, a partnership with, with IES. I would actually kind of maybe even turn to maybe even Nancy or Aaron to talk a little bit about this from the curricular side in terms of I know you've um, done some things with bringing on some new faculty and have this focus around policy. If you want to know sort of what my, my hope is, um, I'd love to see the university um, position itself in such a way that we are, we are working really closely with some of our legislators to help shape legislation and help shape environmental policy. And I think that's the direction we're moving in. I know for me, Green Lobby Day was a good launching point um, to start to build some of those, that relationship with not only the Loyola Caucus, um, those elected officials that either represent you know, our campuses or you know, represent um, um, areas where Loyola has interest but also sort of larger nation, national policies. Um, and I think we're moving in that direction. We're building those relationships. We're uh, putting Loyola's sort of name and sort of face out there in terms of uh, a, a, like a, an advocacy body and getting our students more involved in that. Um, and, I, and I don't know if you guys want to talk about it from the sort of research side and from the faculty side, but. Um. Well, I, I can just say from, from any, from engagement side and what I see as far as the, the campus culture, I mean, there, there are a number of efforts underway, whether it's kind of bubbles up from within, whether it's students or faculty who identify opportunities or groups who reach out to us and sort of say, we'd like Loyola at the table. And we see those, we have a pretty exciting one coming up at the end of the month called No Tomorrow, a rally all about climate action um, that'll uh, be taking place um, October 2nd. All right, I have that date in my head. Um, but, uh, but, but there's also, I mean, I think some of the faculty, some of the folks who participated, uh, the, 
in the talks this morning are involved in a number of things and getting engaged. Um, I guess that's what I kind of think about. Yeah, let me give you an example uh, of something very real that we faced about three and a half years ago when we were in the early stages of building our research building out in, at the Health Sciences Campus. Um, many of you probably don't know and probably don't need to care. That campus actually sits in unincorporated Cook County. Uh, it's surrounded by Maywood, Broadview, Riverside, and Forest Park, but it sits in what is left of just a small uh, several hundred acres of land that is not incorporated, but still sits in unincorporated Cook County. Because of that, we were faced, when we were building that building, uh, with having to get it approved under the uh, uh, under a, a 1963 zoning code, which still stood in unincorporated Cook County, which had absolutely none, and I'm not exaggerating at all, absolutely none of the parameters for building energy efficient buildings, getting uh, credits for things like uh, the use of outside air, uh, open atria internally to buildings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We could have taken the easy way out and redesigned that building, which would not have been consistent with what we've been doing on all of our other campuses, to conform to an old zoning code. Instead, we ended up adding about three and a half months at the front end of the design of that building, working with the county to actually rewrite, rewrite their zoning code to conform to be able to build a smart research building out of the Health Sciences campus. It's that kind of, you can call it advocacy, but it's that kind of change that we have been able to affect almost immediately because now what's, uh, what, what we left is not only uh, we're, we're building an outstanding energy efficient research building, a big research building, but also uh, we've, we've left the county with a set of codes and building uh, parameters that others can follow and mimic as well. So we've, and there's other examples of, of no, that kind no, of thing I, where we could have taken these I'm just wondering about, I'm, I guess I'm wondering about social screens and our investments and our endowments. Again, U of Dayton, Georgetown, Stanford, uh, it's come up at Seattle U, it's come up at a lot of our schools. Uh, climate investing at Notre Dame is a huge topic. That's another way to be a public voice. Are we moving on that? I guess I was a faculty member who signed a document asking us uh, to look at those kinds of issues? Yeah, I know, uh, uh, I'm not the guy, uh, but uh, uh, I know that there's been discussions of that at the board level, there's been discussions of that at our finance and investment committees uh, over the past couple of three years, um, but not to so push you off on somebody else, yeah. that's mm -hmm. not my okay, thank you. Okay, question up here in the front. Follow up on, on Would you wait till the mic comes, just so we can make sure we get it recorded, thank you. Follow up on the advocacy. Um, in Springfield right now, there are three climate-related bills. And um, uh, the quick names, I guess, are the ComEd bill, the Exelon bill, and the Clean Jobs bill. And I was just curious, uh, what is Loyola's position on this? Have they taken a position on this? And is there advocacy going on? I, I don't know that at, at this point, we're still really early yet um, in, in our planning for, for our planned Green Lobby Day event in April. We typically do that in April. Um, so we just started to have some conversations. But um, I, I would say yes, uh, we, we, we are advocates for those bills. Um, we have been kind of following those bills for the last several years, um, starting you know, two years ago when we started doing Green, Green Lobby Day. Um, and kind of as we go forward, and I, as I mentioned, the Illinois Environmental Council has been a really good partner because what they do is sort of identif like identify the priorities in terms of those bills and, um, you, you know, help us be part of this sort of larger community action around advocacy for those bills as well. And so um, we've been working with them very well. I think I, that will continue um, and so if you're actually, if you're interested, sir, I'd love to get your information <laughs> before I leave because I'd love to have more community um, engagement. Last year we had, uh, or earlier this year, we had about six or seven community members that actually went with us and went with our students down to Springfield. And it was great to kind of have that 
um, kind of dynamic with our students as well as just perspective, um, outside perspective as part of that trip. Um, and so that's, to me, one of the, the coolest things about doing that sort of joint lobbying kind of activity. And in the back here. And Um, I, I want to come back to the nitty gritty stuff. I'm freezing cold in here. And no, I'm, I mean, this is symbolic, but it is real too, you know. I mean, I, I have my office in the Crown Center, um, probably not the best energy efficient building on this campus. And uh, during the summer, when the outside temperature uh, turned, let's say, 80s or nearly 90s, I'm sitting in my office with a, with a fleece jacket because it's so freezing cold and I have no control over the air condition. Again, I'm only taking that as a symbol of things. I think we need to really come through everything and anything. The light is on. We, don't, we still don't have a dishwasher even here at the IC so that we could slowly but surely um, uh, transform our, even our, our paper cups there into, into normal cups and just put them into the dishwasher and I guess at least that this is uh, more efficient than than what we have here because all the energy efficient um, campuses I know do that yeah, and purchase the, the industry dishwasher. So I'm only giving a few examples here of what lies ahead of us. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a faculty member here <laughs> so I don't have to play the, the blame game on anyone. It is upon us. All of us, certainly. Yeah, I want to see more bicycle racks and then uh, perhaps also more bicycle riders <laughs> because otherwise they don't make sense. Bicycle riders, that, bicycle other, riders that obey the rules of the road. Right. So at the, end, at the end of these examples, however, I want to come back to the new business uh, school building and there I must say I have a few more questions. In the encyclical it says, you know, we have to have prospective environmental assessment. Okay. And uh, some suggestions for that, transparency, participation, um, impact on our environmental impact assessment, that's what it is called, or the impact on, on uh, the, the surrounding location, on the labor, and so on. Pretty, pretty tough stuff. And I'm not so sure, and I don't know that, honestly. I don't know what we have done before we started to, to build that. How is our track record there? And how is the, the eco record with the new business school? Um, the new business school is uh, just opened a couple of weeks ago, as you probably know. So we're not uh, completely sure whether we're going to hit uh, gold lead certified, but that's our, that's our target. So that's kind of the last question that you had. Uh, we went through a, about a seven and a half month process working specifically with our neighbors and two aldermen. For those of you who know anything about the city of Chicago, Chicago is divided into 50 wards. It, it's like 50 kingdoms. Uh, it, it, nothing gets built, including a treehouse, unless the alderman says so. So we, unfortunately, at the Water Tower campus, Pearson is the boundary line. Don't ask me how that happened. But the business school is in one ward, and right across the street, McGuire Hall, the old business school, is in a different ward. So uh, we spent a considerable amount of time and probably at least half of the gray hair on my head working with a variety of community groups and two wards in order to shape what that project looks like today. I'll give you an example uh, of, of one of the things that both us and the developer to the north uh, compromised on um, as we had our uh, various community meetings. There were a lot of folks in the neighborhood that were concerned about safety. And this is not really germane to our conversation here with sustainability, but safety, dark uh, streets, um, a narrow sidewalk along State Street. So we said, OK, we're going to light it and widen it. And if you look at what is there now and what was there before, there was a four foot wide sidewalk along the uh, east edge of State Street. It is now 12 feet wide, and it's lit up like a Christmas tree at night, and the neighbors love it. Uh, there's about seven or eight other different types of things that we did in the design of that building, but the short answer to, qu to your question is, we work very closely with no less than uh, five community <coughs> meetings and a numerous other meetings that took place during the construction to keep everyone up to speed on what was going to be happening on that site. It's not just that building. Everything we do, we must be that diligent with our neighbors and other stakeholders in the area or we wouldn't be allowed to do it. Uh, it it's all about relationships. It's all about making sure that we, we get 
Uh, we earn a level of trust with the aldermen. Uh, between just the two Chicago campuses, we deal with four aldermen. They all have a very different vision of how they want to work within their wards. Um, a quick side story, you know those stamped pavers we have in the intersection, like for example here on Sheridan and Kenmore? Uh, uh, Sheridan is actually the boundary line between one ward and another, and we could not get alignment between the two aldermen on what that stamped paver should look like. I suggested we just do half of it, <laughs> and then the president could drive the mayor by and let the mayor ask the question of why we only did half the intersection. So we do a lot of work, and I'm happy to go into the gory details after, <laughs> after class. And why was the cold up here? Um, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'll find out. <laughs> Terrific. We have another question in the middle and the back. Here, this young woman. She's back row. Sorry, you were sorry. Okay. Hi, my name is Samantha Guthman. I am a first year here at Loyola, and I know that I will be seeing most of this in action, and I'm very excited because I am also part of the Green Learning Community here. But my question is very simple. What if this doesn't work? It sounds very good in theory and in plan, and the numbers and figures can add up, but a lot of things can happen, and it could not work. By 2025, it just, none of this could become a reality. Uh, I mean, I think no plan. That, that's a good question. Uh, I guess by having all of you, and that's why we called it out in the plan, having a process to be held accountable. Um, that's how we make sure it works, right? That's how we make sure that every year we are communicating really clearly what we've achieved, what we haven't, what things maybe we thought today are, are, are great plans. And believe me, I, I work in a, a field that evolves all the time. Um, and so things that look very good today may not look so great two or three years from now. So um, as we set forward our goals over the next five, 10 years to, to address our, our carbon emissions, we need to be keeping clear in our communications and how we share what we've been able to do. And then for all of you to sort of make sure to hold us accountable to those goals we've set forward. So if five years from now, we're not quite as low as, as we wanted to be, you know, Demand why. Um, I always say that I'll be successful in my job when every morning that I show up at work, I've got a line of people out in front of my door saying, like, why didn't we hit our carbon goals? And why don't we have more bike racks? And because that means that it's not just, uh, I forget what Wayne uh, referred to me as, the, the sustainability conscience or something like that. It means that we're all part of the sustainability conscience for, for Loyola. And, and I think to your question, um, what gives me comfort that we will be successful, and it, it's two things. It's, it's goodwill, and I think that clearly exists throughout this university in all populations and within our communities. And the second is uh, consistency with mission. Uh, this is absolutely essential and what we're all about. It's consistent with our Jesuit character. It's consistent with what we stand for as an institution in a city like this. So I have no doubt that it will, but it, when I do, those are the two things I turn to. We have time maybe for one more question on the back side. Two months ago, uh, Minneapolis St. Paul uh, engaged with a, a company called Solar City in planning community solar gardens. And this is a new wrinkle taking away from net metering where solar power is largely on individual homes or on the roofs of individual corporations. But in order to get renters to be able to participate in an apartment building in a major city, the concept of solar community gardens is now getting off the ground. Is Loyola interested in this concept and are you willing to work with local communities, local municipalities, suburbs to the north, as well as the city of Chicago to develop the concept of solar community gardens here in the Chicago metro area. One of the things that happened after uh, Pope Francis issued Laudato Si was there was a meeting at the Vatican of mayors of major cities around the globe. And in the city of Portland, Oregon, the person whom I know, the mayor of Portland, Charlie Hales, was at that meeting. I don't know that Chicago was involved or invited to that meeting, but why aren't we building or 
conceiving of building community solar gardens here in the Chicago metro area in order to enable us to be at the forefront and not falling behind. So. All right, I'll, I'll say two things on that. One of them is that um, there is uh, effort underway here in Cook County. They received one of the grants from the Department of Energy that their Sunshot program to actually look at exactly what you're talking about, community solar projects. And so we've been approached, I think, the challenge that we're finding here in Illinois um, is that we're not Minnesota. Uh, some of the uh, renewables and net metering programs they have in Minnesota are a little bit more forgiving than what we have in Illinois. But we also have, it's not gonna be a surprise to anybody, some other challenges at the state level that uh, might slow us down in implementing something like that. What do you mean? I don't know uh, <laughs> if you've seen anything about that. But, um, but I do think you know that's something, that's one of those alternatives that a, a place like Loyola, or to be honest, any large institution, a large business, a large hospital, anybody who has large real estate available where they can make it available for a program like that should, should be looking at it. We have done some numbers of calculating sort of solar potential off our rooftops, and I will say it, it is modest. There's a couple reasons for that. Some of our roofs aren't really great structurally for doing that. They're big spans and they wouldn't hold the structure up like our Genteel Arena, it's just too wide of a span. But others are covered in green roofs and they're just not eligible for solar. So we we have sort of a little, we did some study with some students on what it would be and it, it's, I'll, it's modest. It, it would be great if we had lots and lots of just vacant land here, because then some of these other things would open up for us. But not everything's there. But it would be totally something that I think we would would look at if it all worked. If if all the arrangements, the partnerships, those those agreements could, could be worked out. Yeah, I, I, I may be going out on a limb here, but unfortunately, uh, I, I, you know, on a continuum of one to ten, ten being your friend, the mayor of Portland, if if that if the, I. Not too familiar with if they're if they're a fairly cutting edge progressive on this field city, uh, I would think Chicago is probably a three or a two. Mm -hmm. um, you know, during the years Aaron mentioned green roofs. During the years of uh, the younger Mayor Daley, um, and there have been several, as you know, um, we were all about green roofs, and it, it it is not inexpensive to put a green roof on the top of a building. And you don't realize how many we have until you're flying around, or next time you land at O'Hare, take a look at all the green roofs, especially in the downtown area. Uh, is that an efficient way to deal with what we're talking about today, or should that be replaced with solar panels? Uh, that's bigger than Loyola in many cases because it bumps into a whole bunch of building codes and issues that are either permissible or not in the city of Chicago, but it is a great great question and I think uh, fertile ground for discussion outside of this room and with uh, maybe perhaps within or among several institutions going to the city. It's actually got me thinking because we are in the process now, we Loyola, finishing up um, our second memorandum of understanding with the city on uh, what we plan to do as far as campus development for the next five years. And the mayor has been pushing us, pushing us, pushing us to finish this so that he could have a press conference with all of the universities in the city that have signed on with their new MOUs, a nice photo op, it would be great if three or four of those universities could get together and say, wait a minute, time out. Let's take this to the next level now, not just talk about what we plan to do to grow our own campuses, but what we might do together in some of these issues that we talked about today. So it's a great idea. a perfect way to end the session. I want to thank all of you for coming, but let's thank our panelists for our